Welcome Wapum crew, secure your tinfoil hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a rocky mountain high. Get sucked into the vortex of the four corners and settle down snugly at mile marker 420 at the Mile High Clubhouse tonight. It is Sunday, January 9th, Monday, January 10th, for those of you across the pond and beyond. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, and thank you so much for joining us tonight on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I hope you guys had an awesome weekend so far. I sure have, because I'm not doing replays, I'm still alive, yesterday was Elvis's birthday, and we had an awesome author on uh, by the name of Mr. Stephen B. Ubaney, and we talked about who murdered Elvis Presley you really need to buy that book and read the whole story because it is very, very intriguing. The different things uh, that are going on with that story and the different things we actually didn't touch on uh, because, yeah, you need to read the book so you can get the whole story. So, Sharon, I did not let the dogs out. I actually let the dogs in and I fed them and just, just that simple act made me feel like I was going to die because I couldn't breathe. And, uh, my heart hurts now. So when I got in here, uh, I checked my, my levels, which I'll do as I finish this intro. And then I'll let you know what our numbers say. When I started off, I was at 92% O2 absorption and my heart rate was at 115. Uh, just sitting my ass here being fat and happy, which I've actually lost a lot of weight due to COVID. Thank you, COVID diet. Um, but if you're listening live right now, you're listening to us on Spreaker.com. Um, you're also listening us uh, to us on KPNL Radio, which you can find at KPNL-DB.com. Make sure, on your personal time, if you're working it, working out, or just at work, make sure you listen to us on Spreaker, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Tumblr, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Deezer, Podcast Addict, and Podcast Chaser. And I don't have to pretend like I'm trying to catch my voice because or my breath because I really am. Um, make sure you go over to our YouTube channel. It's quite awesome. I've been updating it with some thumbnails to make it look spectacular. Instead of having the Spreaker garbage on there, I like to have my own little thumbnail going on. So it's uh, kind of personalized, and, and I still got a lot of work to do on it, but I hope you guys enjoy the work that I have done on it so far. Yeah, it's the same old me, same old voice talking to you through this freaking radio or headset or whatever you're listening to right now. Um, but yeah, at least the pr picture's pretty, and it's not some stupid Spreaker thing that I need to update some more. They only let you do so many updates as far as thumbnails per day. I think it's like 150 or 200. Uh, so yeah, I got cut off last time and then I got COVID and then I, I really didn't get to, uh, finish it. Hello, Miss Sharon. Hello, champ in the chat room. I believe we got Miss Sister Sandra in there as well. Let me look. Oh, Skywatcher. Hey, good to see you. Sorry about the replays, man. You know, I really wanted to be here with you guys. I, I was able to do the Christmas show, which I felt out of my ever loving mind. Cause like I said, I couldn't breathe. I felt you know, halfway misfigured as far as my brain goes. I could not form a, a coherent thought. I felt like I was just totally out of this world. Quite a few times I felt like I was in another realm. Uh, that was quite interesting. But, you know, I'm still here. I'm still alive. My poor husband, on the other hand, is in the hospital. He is fighting his ass off, trying to keep his O2 levels up. He can't eat. He can't drink. He can't do certain things because he can't fucking breathe. And so, uh, they've been trying to intubate him and, and he's been fighting it, fighting the good fight. He doesn't want to be intubated because a lot of people don't come back from that shit. But, uh, the doctors are like, Hey, okay. So I stayed up till seven o'clock this morning when I finally went to bed. And then I got woken up by the doctors telling me that they want to intubate him because, you know, he's got high blood pressure. He can't eat. He can't drink. Even going pee, his his levels drop. Hey, that's normal. They're talking about in the 70s. The bad shit that I've heard, when it gets to the 40s and 50s, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You need to be fucking intubated. But he's fighting hard, and he's keeping those O2 levels up, and, and he's trying not to be intubated. And the doctor 
called me this morning and scared the shit out of me and told me my husband's gonna fucking die. Uh, seriously? What the fuck are you calling me this morning and telling me this does not compute? This is not going to happen. I do not accept this. Uh, but yeah, that's what, what they told me this morning. Like, we'd rather intubate him today than wait till this evening because our evening staff just isn't as functional as our daytime staff. So would you please tell your husband to let us shove this hose down his throat? Thank you very much. You have a lovely day. Bless your pointed little heads. I do appreciate all that uh, they've done for him. And they've been contacting me every day and, and keeping me updated on the status of my husband, Burn. Um, we're just hoping he makes it through this. We're hoping he doesn't die because that would really suck. Um, yeah, it's pretty scary. Uh, that's why I didn't check into the hospital because I knew they were going to try to keep my ass. You ain't keeping me. I got kids to take care of. I can't leave my kids, especially with my husband all jammed up there in the freaking hospital. Go F yourself. Oh, on that point, my oxygen level is at 94 and my heart rate is at 109. So we're doing pretty good. Looks like the show's good to go. Because I can breathe enough to read you some fucked up Hollywood legends and urban legends and myths, etc, etc. But yeah, if you guys could put out uh, some prayers and... Uh, some positive energy for my husband. <laughs> Try not to get teary-eyed here. I'm feeling the Um, Yeah, that's... Everybody's like, what do you need? I need prayers and positive energy. I need to not be <laughs> a widow at the age of 43. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, but yeah, the kids are resilient. We all got COVID at the same time. We all got smashed with it. Here you go. Have a healthy coding of COVID. Um, thanks to my lovely sister that you guys, good news. I actually had somebody pull in here today, not once, but twice. Uh, last time I looked out the front door, they had her trailer rigged up to their truck and she is the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. I said that last month. She's finally gone. Gone. Goodbye. I actually talked to her today and I didn't kill her. We didn't kill each other. We didn't fight. Things actually turned out pretty, pretty damn well. Uh, cause I was like, Sarah, my husband's in the hospital dying. I can't pay for your electricity anymore. And somebody's coming to get your trailer right now. So get your shit together. And she's like, come in here. And I'm like, I don't want to come in your house. So I just stood at her door and talked to her. But yeah, I told her you got to get your shit together. Cause, cause you're leaving. You know, I, uh, I booted you last month and you're still here and, and I can't do this, you know? I'm going to be a single parent again for the second time in my life. Uh, so, yeah, I can't I can't afford to take care of my kids and an adult who should be functional and taking care of her own shit. I'm not here to wipe your ass. You need to move along. I love you, but goodbye. Goodbye, David. <laughs> Seriously, so good news. We're making progress. We're making progress. <clears throat> we just need to keep Vern alive, okay? So... If you can uh, say prayers, send positive energy, it would be much appreciated. I, I would really love you and appreciate you for that. But hello everyone and welcome to Storytime with me, Tessa TNT. Yes, I'm still alive. I, I, uh, it was looking pretty hairy for a bit and, <clears throat> and yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm hard headed. Um, I did go to the hospital with my husband. I'm like, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't need to go to the hospital. I can fight this. I could get through this. I don't want to be locked down. I don't want to be intubated. I don't know. I don't want all this other shit. So, uh, we sat in the waiting room together and then he checked in and yeah, I get a pack of love diapers for my sister and send her on her merry way. But yeah, uh, we sat there and he checked in and the other check-in lady kept looking at me like, aren't you going to check in too? And I just got my arms crossed like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. I'm not checking in. This guy is, this fool over here. He's going to check in, but not me. And <laughs> so we went back there and uh, they checked his oxygen levels. They checked his heart rate. They checked his temperature. Um, took all his side effects and everything, which he actually didn't have the same ones as me. I was very surprised. 
I lost my sense of taste, my sense of smell. I got the cold chills. I got the body aches. I got the fevers. I got the sweats. I got the, oh, all kinds of shit. Uh, did I already say muscle fatigue? Because that's a big one. Like, even holding up my head really fucking sucked for a while. Um, I couldn't breathe. Like, just going to the bathroom, I thought I was going to die. Yesterday, you should have seen me. I took a shower because I finally got my sense of smell back. And I'm like, damn, who put this dead body in my fucking bed? Oh, wait, that's me. Um, so, yeah, I took a shower and, and almost died from that. But, you know, I lived through it. It was a two-hour process just to get showered and dried off and, and clothed and get my hair brushed and, and shit so I could do the show yesterday. And it was epic. I really had a great time. I'm so glad I did that instead of another fucking replay because I'm sick of those. Um, but yeah, I took him to the doctors and then they stuck us in the waiting room and then they stuck us back in the room and she's like, I don't care if you have to pee or shit or you're going to shit your pants. You guys got COVID. So, well, she didn't know I did, but she knew he did. So she's like, you guys got to stay in this room. You're in lockdown because cancer patients and other people have to use these bathrooms and we don't need you infecting everyone. I totally get it. Totally understand. So I, I stayed in my place there in the in the hospital room while poor Vern is sitting there trying to read. Hey, Jojo the Slap Boy! Long time no see, brother. I missed you. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, so they gave him some steroids and they gave him some oxygen and then we left the nice little carry-along oxygen machine they gave him in the room because the oxygen guy was actually waiting for us in the, in the parking lot. So we went out there and, uh, pulled up right behind his van and this guy was very pleasant he uh said a few words that made me think he was from the south um a very very pleasant nice demeanor very professional this guy needs a like four thumbs up for the great job he's doing but he gave us some um some oxygen bottles and an oxygen machine and got Vern home got him strapped in and and you know like i said I didn't check in at the hospital. I don't trust those guys. So I get home and next day I call my doctor and I'm like, hey, uh, I tested positive for COVID. Can you please prescribe me this certain drug? I can actually look it up really quick. Uh, it's, it's got a meta, meta name in it. Let me look really quick like, but I was like, hey, uh, I got COVID. Can you uh, prescribe me this drug and and we'll be all good? And and she's like, uh, okay, it's called dexamethasone. So dexamethasone, six milligrams. You take one in the morning and one in the evening, both times with food. It's a must, or you might get sick, as far as throwing up or whatnot. But I'm like, uh, yeah. So I got COVID. I know you don't want me to come in the office. Can you please prescribe me this shit? Uh, so I could get on my healing process and on my merry little way. And, and then she calls me back and she's like, Hey, sorry, you got COVID. I had it too. I was down for like six weeks and no, I can't prescribe you shit because I haven't seen you. And that's the rules when it comes to your insurance you have and blah, blah, blah. I have to see you and this has to go through hoops so you can get this medication. So she's like, what I prescribe for you is lots of fluids and lots of rest. So that's what I've been doing. But poor Vern, man. We're about nine years apart. So on his birthday, on his birthday, he got COVID. December 22nd, my poor husband gets COVID. And uh, I got it the day before, which we probably had it before then. But that's when it really kicked in on the gears. So we didn't even have Christmas dinner. Like all the Christmas dinner shopping we did and everything still sitting in the fridge. Um, but yeah, we all got sick. We opened presents, went, went back to our our little humble places and in, in the world which mine was my pillow and my bed which I feel like I have cauliflower ear kinda you know that shit hurts I had to actually start putting my fuzzy sweater in between my head and my pillow cuz ow um but yeah just been getting lots of rest lots of fluids trying not to die uh, brave Sir Robin out there asked me hey you got any New Year's resolutions I'm like, yeah, brother, guess what I sure do? I got some New Year's resolutions. Stay the fuck out of the hospital and stay alive. Those are my two New Year's resolutions. If I can do that, I'll be good. But yeah, uh, right now it's 
it's looking good for us. Like the kids, like I said, they're resilient. They got sick. They were the first ones to get sick. Had I known what they had, I would have worn a mask when I was taking care of them, but I didn't know. And would that have even helped anyways? Who fucking knows? Um, it's too late for that. But yeah, so, uh, they got sick, had their fevers, the, it ran their course. Now they're ping ponging off the walls. Like they've had a freaking half gram of crack. Uh, everybody's like, hey, be quiet. We're trying to rest. Luckily Nova, who is my, uh, my immune deficient child, she is doing epic. Uh, she, she's been the least sick out of all the kids. I'm very proud of her. Uh, she woke up the other day coughing and it, it scared the shit out of me. I was like, oh boy, here we go. Here we go. Now it's Nova. Now it's Nova's turn. And, uh, I just can't handle this shit. I can't, I can't. Uh, but luckily she's been resilient. The kids have been resilient. They've been good. I om only half-ass died and we're just trying to keep my husband out of the gutter here. So we're trying to keep him alive. So like I asked before, please send your positive energy, your prayers, all that stuff for Vern because he really is a good guy and... He deserves it. Nobody deserves this COVID shit. And you know what really chaps my hide? <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I don't ask for a lot, guys. Okay, sometimes I'll be like, hey, can you uh, send me some money so I can keep my show going? Because, you know, it costs money to do this shit. Um, and, yes, some of you have done that, and I've really appreciated it. It's It's been epic. You guys are the best. Thank you for doing that, like, a year ago. Um... But, yeah, I don't ask for a lot, and so I'm I'm asking my friends for prayers on Facebook. Not for me, because fuck me. I don't give a fuck about me. Um, I've had COVID. Nobody even fucking knows it. It's me that's had COVID. It's my husband who it hit really hard. Had it not hit him hard, I wouldn't have told anybody, because people are so fucking nosy. Oh, did you get vaccinated? Oh, well, if you've been vaccinated, you'll survive. Go fuck yourself. You don't know. This is a new science. This is a new vaccination. Uh, even my daughter got vaccinated and her old man and they caught it. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, it's uh, it's stupid. All I'm asking for is prayers. Don't ask me stupid fucking questions. Stupid questions win stupid prizes. And I ain't telling you shit because it's none of your business. Just give me some prayers or don't. That's, that's all I'm saying. But yeah, poor guy. I, I'm hanging in there for him and he's... He's fighting his ass off, man. He is he is going hardcore. He's trying to fight this thing, trying to keep that tube out of his throat cuz once you go tube, it's it's hard to get readjusted. Can you do monoclonal treatment? What is that? Okay, so my friend asked me, uh did your husband get antibiotics? Did your husband get probiotics? Did your husband get uh, COVID biotics, did your husband get this, this, that, that, blah, blah, blah. A lot of the things that they're asking, uh, by the time he went to the hospital, which was not too long after he got sick because, you know, he's pretty, pretty, uh, hospital efficient as far as he gets sick, he goes to the hospital. He's not like me. I'm hard headed. I don't like to go to the hospital. I don't trust the medical field. It really fucking freaks me out unless I'm on the deathbed. I will not go to the hospital, or unless I'm about to squeeze out a kid, I will not go to the hospital. So, either squeezing out a kid or about to die, those are the two reasons I go to the hospital. So far, I haven't done that, but I'm trying to figure out what is the monoclonal treatment. Is that the antibodies and shit? Like, taking antibodies from other people and giving it to the sick people? Or, uh, Jojo, can you, can you, uh... Fill me in on that, what exactly that is, because that sounds pretty interesting. Monoclonal treatment. I'm going to have to write that down, because when the doctor calls me tomorrow to give me another fucked up update to keep me from getting more than three hours of sleep per day, I could say, hey, what about this? You guys do this monoclonal, because they've done, I swear to God, they've done everything else. Every fucking thing else. That is on the fucking menu of fucked up shit to do to a person to keep them from dying from COVID. I think they've done everything except for this monoclonal. Okay, so let me write this down. Monoclonal treatment. I wrote it down on my Palm Pilot. Soon to be on my Bob Ross. I actually bought myself a Bob Ross calendar this year for uh, Christmas. Bob Ross is awesome. 
I bought my daughter a pinup girl calendar because she loves the goyles. Um, but yeah, mono, monoclonal treatment. Very interesting. Let me know. He needs a vitamin C shot. You know what, Sharon? <laughs> when it comes to vitamin C and my husband being sick, there's a proficient amount of vitamin C that a person should take to keep from getting sick and to stay healthy. But when he gets sick, he grabs that bottle of vitamin C and it's like eating Skittles. This guy doesn't know when to stop. He's like, oh, here, have like 10 more of these vitamin C's. It's gonna, it's gonna cure what ails you. Okay, you say, you have to take it within the first 10 days of symptoms. Yeah, I think it's too late for that because... Um, like I said, his symptoms kicked in on the 22nd, and here we are on the 9th, so, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah, the 31st was 10 days, so no, they didn't do that. Uh, you, okay, so. vitamin C shot, sounds great. I've been taking my zinc, my vitamin C, my D3, my, all my good stuff. And now I have heartburn. Holy shit. What the crack? I think it was that Subway sandwich I ate right before the show. Oy. Oh, wow. I think I need some, some Rolaids. I'm going to have to message my daughter. Hey, on your way home, can you grab some Rolaids? When you bring in me that sushi... That was my special request for today. Okay, so, like I said before, my uh, my symptoms, one of them, and the worst thing being, loss of taste and smell. And, oh my gosh, at first it was kind of like a blessing because, you know, my husband rips ass, I don't have to smell it, like, you know, all the fucked up shit that stinks around my house. I don't have to smell it. Take ungodly amounts of vitamins according to my nephew see that's what my uh, husband does with vitamin c ungodly amounts of vitamin c i'm like you do know that a certain amount of vitamin c in your body is not good for you right like just because you haven't been taking it this whole time and now all of a sudden you're sick and you're taking tons of it does not mean it's gonna make you better high dose until you have the shits and then cut back on the dose <laughs> Good good advice for you guys not in the chat room. Sharon just said, that's great. Take vitamin C, high dose, until you have the shits, then come back, cut back on the dose. So that's what our nurse, Miss Nurse Sharon, is uh, saying here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, my thing is, it's so weird because I have a regimen of vitamins that I take every night. And I ran out of my DHA and there's one more uh, that I ran out of. And once that happens, for some reason, like, I I fall off the whole fucking wagon. B12 kills your sex drive. Luckily, I don't take any B vitamins. And I don't care about sex for the last year, so, yeah, I'm good. Um, but yeah, anytime I run out of, like, two of my vitamins, so my DHA and there's one more uh, that I ran out of, I kind of just fall off the whole vitamin wagon. I should just keep taking it, and I did for a little bit, but then the heartburn was kicking in which I still have really bad. I need to text uh, Kinsey right now. Grab me some Rolaids. Oh, I'll see you in the morning. Holy crap. Grab me some Rolaids, please. So uh, I think I just got some bad news from, from the guy who was... Man, I said Rolaids, not Rollins. What are Rollins? <laughs> Oh my gosh. And so the guy that was going to haul my sister's trailer out, I thought I got rid of the bitch. I think I'm stuck for another day. But he said, they were out here and we've been working on it. I'm going to come back in the morning with some different equipment to get this out of here. I'll see you then. Sorry, a little more work. Things are broke on the trailer. I'll see you in the morning. What the heck? wonder what she did. I wonder if she sabotaged it. We got the trailer in here. We should be able to get the trailer out. Like, what the crack? This is so weird. 
How how the fuck we get the trailer in here, and now it's broken and they can't get it out? Uh, sounds like sabotage to me, my brain. We're already on our way. What are Rolays? Do they have them at the gas station? Yes. <sighs> Please, my heart hurts. My heart hurts for different reasons. My heart hurts because of heartburn, and my heart hurts because, you know, uh, my heart rate has been at a workout speed forever. Yeah, banishing. Oh my god. Seriously. Like, how is this working? And it's crazy because, like, I haven't talked to my sister since the beginning of December, and she's not even my real sister. She's been my sister since 98. Uh... I adopted her parents, and so therefore I had to adopt her stupid fucking ass. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we got, gave her a trailer, and she took that as an invitation to move into our yard, because I'm like, Vern, why'd you allow her to live here? I didn't allow her to live here. Why'd you allow her to live here? And I was like, I didn't allow her to live here. I've lived with my sister in the past. Does not work. I would never, ever, 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 ever. Have her live with me. Again. Last time we lived together, a fucking fire started and half the fucking county burnt down, okay? So, we don't live together. <sighs> so, neither one of us could figure out how the fuck she got living here. We gave her a trailer, told her she could work on it here, never told her she could live here. She just moved her happy ass in. And then she was telling me about squatters' rights and shit, and I was like, oh, I see where this is going. I see what your plan is. Oh, man. Banishing. Do any of you guys know a good banishing spell? <laughs> Ricola! <laughs> you guys are so funny. Look up Goatman of Maryland stories. Yes. That's almost as scary as my sister. Sharon says, I to take Kalittle cl Silver daily with B12... I take daily, even when my son had the Shimona when I was living with him. Light some sage. And it's funny, Sharon, my sister actually for Christmas sent me an Irish Clada, which is a man's ring. I don't know where the fuck she got it. Why she sent it to me, except for she knows, like, I really love Irish Cladas. Those are one of my favorite rings. And when I was going to get married the first time, that's what I wanted. And, and the fucker bought a dolphin ring and I ended up disappearing. Um, smoke, smoke from the peace pipe. Hey, I did that last night. I'd been trying to smoke, uh, weed for quite a while. Um, I was actually able to take a hit or a few last night and it tickled my lungs like no other. All right. So do a banishing spell. Yes, I have one burn sage. So with that Clada ring, uh, my sister also sent me a great big old thing of sage because my dog somehow locked herself in here in my studio and then she ate all my sage except for a few little wisps of it, which I've been using occasionally. <laughs> Jason says, Vanishing Cream. That's a good song. He sounds like the lady who started the Chicago Fire, old Mrs. Leary. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I need to get some sage and... Sage around my house or something, man. This bitch. She's been using my, my husband and our my family's name in vain and lying about us to her fucking own daughter when she's verbally abusing her daughter, saying we're, we're disappointed in her. Luckily, her daughter knew better and contacted me, and I was like, I could not be prouder of you. I know. I know where the fuck you came from, and I am proud of you. You are an amazing mom. You're an amazing person. You're taking care of your life. You're taking care of your shit. Don't listen to the bullshit your mom is telling you because we are not disappointed in you whatsoever. We are proud of you. We're disappointed in that bitch. Um, but yeah. So yeah, there's been crazy stuff going on. I was just proud of myself that when I went out there to tell her, Hey Sarah, my husband's in the hospital dying. Uh, I can't afford to pay for your shit anymore. Uh, there's a guy coming to move your trailer out. And she's like, hey, come in here. And I'm like, oh, what, she got the axe or something? This bitch got the axe. She's going to chop my head. I didn't go in there. I opened the door and stood at her door and let, let all the cold air in. Irish clitoris is what I thought she said at first. No, clada. Isn't that what it's called? I used to call it an Irish savant, and that was not it. It's an Irish clada ring. 
not clitoris. Dirty mind, man. Get out of the gutter. What's wrong with you, Jason? Jeez. <laughs> uh, Sharon said, laugh out loud. She just sent her bag to you to pack. Gave you sage for you to banish her. Oh, no, no. That was my sister, Kathy. Okay, my actual blood sister for Christmas. Sent me a box with a bag in it that said uh, Cody the Golden Cock. Which she's got a thing for cocks. Like she's got roosters all over her house. Like her house is full of cocks. But uh, my sister sent me this Irish clitor ring. My actual sister. And she sent me a big ass wand of white sage. For me to get rid of crazy bitches like this in my side yard. So my sister here in the side yard. Uh, yeah. She's the one that needs to be banished. And I was proud of myself. Like we talked cordially. We didn't kill each other today. When I told her she was leaving, I almost told her I loved her, but I'm still fucking pissed off at her. So I didn't. And I know life's too short for that. And, and I feel bad for it. So maybe I'll tell her tomorrow before she fucking leaves. But, uh, yeah, holy shit. So that's almost a, a end of another fucked up uh, chapter. Maybe I can have my friend come and, and live with me, depending on what happens. And who lives, who dies, who, who makes it off the fucking island. Now it's time for story time on COVID Corner. Hopefully I don't die I'm trying to read to you guys. But I just had to fill you in on what's been going on in my neck of the woods because shit's been crazy, man. Uh, but yeah, it, usually like, so as far as my daily schedule goes, I'll get the kids clothes washed and uh, I'll get the kids clothes together and Put their clothes together for the next day. I'll pack their bags with snacks and water and all that fun shit. And I'll stay up till like 5 or 6 in the morning and go to sleep. And then my husband gets up at 7 and he'll get the kids ready and send them off for school. But since he's been gone this week at the hospital, I've been having to do it all really. Except for my daughter Nova. She's been packing the snacks for me, but I still do everything else. It's the little things, you know. It's just the small things. I'm. Can you just do the snacks that'd be great because I feel like I'm about to die um but yeah she's been helping me out and she's been doing epic kudos to Nova send her some positive energy she rocks she's a fucking rock star uh me and her and Kinsey so Kinsey's my daughter <laughs> what the... yeah Kathy loves cock she's got it all over her house um <laughs> and she went to rehab guys she finally did it so she said, oh, the Monday after Christmas, I'm going to rehab. And then, uh, so I didn't call her or anything. And, um, and then I got her package and I was like, well, yeah, I really haven't heard anything from her, but, uh, I'm going to say thank you for, for my sage and my man's ring. Anyways, I guess she's telling me I have man hands. I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> uh, I was like, thanks for my present, sister. I really loved it. And she's like, oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you loved it. And then, then I knew she was still at home and, and she didn't go into rehab like she said she was going to. And, uh, so, <laughs> uh, the other night I'm laying in bed and trying not to die. And, uh, she's like, hey, are you still awake? And it's like three o'clock in the morning. So fuck yeah, I'm still awake. And, uh, so she calls me and she's like, hey, I, I just wanted to let you know I'm glad you liked your present and, and I'm going to rehab in the morning and, uh, I probably won't be able to call you for a while, but, but I'll write you and I'll let you know what the address is and everything, so. <sighs> so my sister went to rehab and it was funny because, uh, the weekend or two ago, I think it was the weekend, so it was the night of the Christmas party that we did here online and, uh. I called her that night because everybody tapped out on me and and uh, so I called her and I'm talking to her and I'm like, so you think uh, you think this rehab's gonna stick this time? She's like, what are you talking about? Well, my oldest brother told me because my sister, we all we all had problems growing up because our mom was killed by a drunk driver and uh, their dad was a military asshole and my dad was a drunken retard. Just kidding. He was really smart. He should have won Jeopardy. 
uh, but he did drink, drink a lot and do coke. I think he even freebased some prostitutes. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, so I heard, I heard that, uh, you know, she, I knew she had problems with drugs as a kid. I remember her hooking up with older guys cause her daddy issues and shit and, um, Kinsey just tried to call me then realized I'm doing a show. Uh, but yeah, I was told, man, she's been in rehab so many times throughout her life and blah, blah, blah. That shit ain't ever going to stick. So the other night when I'm talking to her, uh, you're all the woman, Tessa, I know. Yeah, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it. <laughs> I call myself a mutant. I don't say, I'm woman, hear me roar. I'm, I'm a mutant and be afraid, be very afraid. Uh, but anywho, so, yeah, I thought for sure, you know, my sister had gone to rehab before and shit, so I was like, hey, you, you think it's gonna stick this time? And she's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I was like, your rehab sister? And she's like, I've never been to rehab before in my life. And I'm like, what about these programs? Like, every time you've gotten out of prison and, and, uh, what about these different programs you've done in the past? Like, wasn't that considered rehab? And she's like, no. Those were programs to get back into society from prison. Had nothing to do with rehab. Although, like, there was no smoking, no nothing allowed. And they were running and, and they were doing all kinds of healthy other shits to try to get over their unhealthy freaking shits. But, uh, yeah, I guess this will be her first time doing rehab. So, hey, here's to hoping it sticks because she's an amazing person and she's an amazing light and... She's beautiful, and she's my mutant sister. We're, we're actual blood, and, you know, we got some of the same genetics. Not all, thank God, because I'd be af very afraid. Um, but, yeah, hopefully it sticks. Hopefully she does good this time and, and stays out of prison, because she's got a beautiful family. She's got beautiful kids and beautiful grandkids. Oh, my God, I love her grandkids. They're so cute. I'm about to have one on, ha uh, I almost said Halloween. I think it's uh, supposed to be the day before Valentine's Day, which is actually my Uncle Daddy Bill's birthday, February 13th. Watch, this baby's going to be like a little Valentine's baby, unless she has to be induced like I was with all my Klingons. But yeah, here's to hoping, here's to hoping that Kathy uh, makes it through re rehab and doesn't fall off her rocker again and... Here's to hoping that Kinsey has a beautiful son named Archer, and here's to hoping that Vern lives to be a grandpa. Alright, so I don't think there's anything else on my personal shelf I want to share with you. I'm trying to think really quick. Hmm. Any other fucked up shit I need to share? Let me think. Well, right before I went on the show, my sister-in-law called me. My brother doesn't even know what I've been going through because he's a workaholic and he's got enough shit on his plate. Uh, but she called and let me know that she's thinking about me and she'll let my brother know. But yeah, that was nice of her. Thanks, Miss. Thank you, Miss Chrissy Johnson, for checking up on us. We're still alive. We're hanging in there, and Burns fighting his ass off. Taking healthy shits ensures a healthy colon. Thank you, Dr. Jason. All right, so the book that we've been reading from in the past is called Hollywood Urban Legends, the truth behind all those delightfully persistent myths of film, television, and musica. Pubic places, beware of pubic places. Make sure you guys satanize your hands, okay? Wash and satanize your hands before you come up in my house. Because God forbid I get another bout of COVID. I might have to kill somebody this time. <laughs> Alright, so we left off on Fargoing the Truth. So this is the uh, truth, myth, and lore, and blah, blah, blah behind Fargo. We actually got... I don't even know. I might even restart this story. <laughs> Oh, man. I guess I will, because it's only a, really a page and a half. 
before we get to the point we are here and I don't want you guys to miss out on anything because it's been a while since we did story time. So far going the truth. Premiere Magazine. How close was the script for Fargo to the actual event? Ethan Cohen. Pretty close. Rent the classic comedy mystery thriller Fargo or catch it on cable some night and you'll see this opening title card. This is a true story. The events depicted in this film took place in Minnesota in 1987. At the request of the survivors, the names have been changed. Out of respect for the dead, the rest has been told exactly as it occurred. So, when I saw Fargo for the first time, I was quickly enveloped in its quirky, dark charm, which resonated all the more with me because I believed I was actually watching a fictionalized rendition of events that really occurred. So as the story unraveled, I couldn't wait to find the newspaper articles or perhaps even a book that would fill me in on the real story of Chief Gunderson, or whatever her true name might be, and her pursuit of the corrupt auto dealer, Jerry Lundergaard, and the two psychotic lumps of evil he had hired to kidnap his wife. Turns out, the joke was on me. <laughs> there were no articles to be found in the archives of the Minnesota papers, nor had any of the books been written about the supposed kidnapping scam in 1987 that went haywire and eventually led to seven murders in various Minnesota towns. So that's because none of that stuff ever happened. Fargo was 100% fiction, and the true story ruse was just another practical joke from those wacky Cohen brothers, Joel and Ethan. So, the Coens have a reputation for playing around with the facts and with the media in this fashion. For example, even though they edit their own movies, they've created a fictional editor named Roderick James. A pompous sort who has supposedly written the introduction for the printed versions of some Cohen scripts and has talked up his contributions to Barton Fink and Miller's Crossing while subtly jabbing Ethan and Joel. Still, one can't really fault the scores of reviewers and feature writers who believe Fargo was based in reality. Strange and Byzantine as the story was, it wasn't any more bizarre than some of the true life crime stories we hear about all the time. And even the production notes in the press kit said it was a true story. And so, Premiere Magazine called Fargo a true life tale. And the film uh, threat magazine said Fargo was based on a true tale of a botched kidnapping. And the movie critic for the Orlando Sentinel wrote, This is a true story. Explains an introductory note. And as eccentric as the new film is, its story indeed rings true. In most movies about real events, the filmmakers leave out information that would get in the way of the main storyline. But one of Fargo's strengths is that the odd, awkward details don't appear to have been airbrushed away. So even the South China Post got into the act, and in 1996 review, Fargo, then, is a different kind of project based on an actual event that took place in Minnesota in the American Midwest in 1987. But some enterprising reporters started doing some checking and it was quickly apparent that Fargo wasn't any more reality based than The Wizard of Oz. First, there's not a single person in Minnesota who can remember anything like the plot of Fargo unfolding in real life in the 1980s. You'd think people in a small town like Brainerd Minnesota would remember things like a cop getting shot and an auto salesman arranging for his wife's kidnapping and a string of murders, not to mention the pregnant police chief who eventually brought the killers to justice. As a statistician, Kathleen Leatherman of the Minnesota Bureau of uh, Criminal Apprehension told the Minneapolis Star Tribune, this is 
major fiction. There were no officers killed in 1987, and there's nothing that even vaguely relates to these circumstances. I'd still put Fargo on my list of the 100 greatest American movies, and it's an original and sly piece of work charged with terrific writing, faultless pacing, and a smart cast led by Fred Francis McDormand. Oh, look, never brought a sushi. What the fuck is this? That's all they had. I got one for me, too. Well, it looks delightful. Thank you I so much. I dropped it, but it didn't break Hey, it it'll go down the same way. <laughs> no, um, we might go down McKenzie's for a bit. Okay. I love you. I love you, too. Thank you for my Rolaids and my, my California salad roll. Man, I wanted a rainbow roll. I wanted some... Sick ass fresh fish <sighs> for my sick ass. Okay, where were we? Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. Okay, so I still put Fargo on my list of the 100 greatest American movies. It's an original and a sly piece of work charged with terrific writing, faultless pacing, and a smart cast led by Frances McDormand in her Oscar winning performance. But I wonder. Would it have been quite so captivating that first time I saw it had I not been under the mistaken impression that it was based on a true story? I'll never know. The experience is locked in the past and cannot be revisited or revised. So in a way, the Coen brothers' dishonest little joke backfired on them. The minor tempest created by the is it real or not investigations and the subsequent articles about the controversy served as a minor distraction from what should have been a pure celebration of innovative filmmaking. The legacy of Fargo was ever so slightly bruised by the brothers lie and they have only themselves to blame. Sometimes you can be just a little too clever for your own damn good. <laughs> Sorry. I uh, went a little uh, Elmer Fudd there. Uh, <laughs> I was just reading uh, Jason's com comments. Sharon, come sit on my lap while Tessa reads. Um, excuse me, what the fuck is Fargo? Have you not ever seen Fargo, Sharon? M -m -m my Sharon, come on. It's a movie. You betcha. You gotta watch this movie if you haven't ever seen this movie, Fargo. You betcha, it's a good one. It's a good one. I'll tell you what, you're really missing out if you don't uh, you don't listen to this or watch this Fargo movie. Let's see. I guess I could get into this next story before we go to our brick. You gotta watch it, dude. It's like it's classic fucking cinema. You gotta watch this movie. You know the. The person being fed through the wood chopper and even Nicolas Cage is in there, bitch. You gotta watch it. Nicolas Cage, man. You betcha. And just just the accent, you know, from Fargo. You betcha. It's a good one. <laughs> Never, says Sharon. <laughs> All right. For this next story. I got a briefcase full of soul, baby. Quentin Tarantino's groundbreaking and exhilarating masterpiece, Pulp Fiction, is the kind of movie you can watch again and again, discovering new pleasures each time. The overlapping and time-shifting storylines, the attention to the smallest background details, and the off-quoted dialogue, the surf music soundtrack, and the wonderful performance from the all-star cast make this one of the best and most influential films of the 1990s. So at the heart of the movie is a briefcase that men will kill for. When one of, one has this briefcase in his possession and opens it for the first time to behold the glowing miracle inside, he is re reduced to a uh, speechless awe. He can not even speak anymore. Yeah, Cage is in that shit, Sharon. Uh, Google it. You gotta watch the Fargo, okay? You betcha. You'll, you'll love it. So what's inside the fucking briefcase? That's what I've always wondered. Like, what the fuck is in there? 
The characters never get specific about it. They think say things like, is that what I think it is? And the movie never shows us. Every shot of the briefcase is from behind its open lid. We see people react to it as the contents give off a golden glow. But that hasn't stopped some aficiona, aficionados of Tarantino's work from asserting that they know exactly what's inside. A frequently posted internet message. If you all are anything like me, then you had no idea what was in the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. But there's no longer any mystery about what's inside the briefcase. A friend of a friend of mine who had a two-hour conversation with Quentin Tarantino himself, and thanks to that talk, I now know the key to the film. Remember the first time you were introduced to the Marsalis Wallace? The first shot of him was of the back of his head in the bar as he's talking to Bruce Willis. You'll notice there's a large band-aid on the back of his head and if he'd been operated on. Now remember the combination of the lock on the briefcase was 666. Then remember that when anyone opened the briefcase it glowed and they were in amazement at how beautiful it was. Now bring in some Bible knowledge and remember that when the devil takes your soul he takes it from the back of your head. Yep, you guessed it. Marsalis Wallace had sold his soul to the devil and was trying to buy it back. The three kids at the beginning of the movie were the devil's helpers. And remember that when the kid came out of the bathroom with a hand cannon, Jules and Vincent were not harmed by the bullets. God came down and stopped the bullets because they were saving a soul. It was divine intervention. Pretty cool, huh? That's pretty cool shit, man. You can't make that shit up. Pretty cool indeed. Especially the part about Tarantino graciously taking two hours to explain to a friend of a friend the intricacies of Pulp Fiction plot points that he hasn't revealed to anyone else. What a guy. <laughs> Alright, so... As anonymous internet posting theories go, however, this one isn't bad. Violent, profane, and disturbing as Pulp Fiction is at times, there are also a number of religious and spiritual themes infused in the story. I.e. Samuel L. Jackson's character, Jules, was a spiritually awakened person and he's forever citing Ezekiel 25:17 from the Bible. The passage Jules recites doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible, but come on, the guy hit, the guy's a hit man for crying out loud. Give him some points for trying. Oh, I I do remember the uh, whole Valley of Death and everything, so I'm not sure. Maybe that's another Mandela effect. I don't fucking know. All right, I E point number two, Miss Zuma Thurman. Okay, so this bitch snorts a deadly dose of heroin. And is literally brought back from the dead after receiving an injection of adrenaline. The Eric Stoltz character who thrusts the needle into her chest and brings her back to life has a hairstyle and beard that makes him resemble the traditional holy card images of Jesus. You know what? There better not be a motherfucking dog in my room. Get out! It was a dog. Mother. Fucker. And that's it. Kids are going to pay. They're going to pay for this. Alright, so. I.E. Point number three, boys and girls. After that volley of bullets mysteriously misses Jules and his partner, Vincent Vega, a.k.a. Mr. John Travolta, they have a heated debate about whether it was divine intervention, intervention or just plain dumb luck. Note that Jules... Who believes it's a sign from God is saved. Vincent, the eternal skeptic, doesn't survive the film. It's possible the briefcase contains a human soul. It's possible it contains anything, considering that we never see what's inside, but that doesn't explain why anyone who gazes upon the contents recognizes them. I don't know about you, but I have no idea what a human soul looks like. Maybe it comes with a label. Who knows? In 1994, the Toronto Star invited readers to uh, send in their theories on what was in the briefcase. The most popular suggestion was an Oscar. 
other entries. Number one, the severed ear from Reservoir Dogs. Number two, O.J. Simpson's other glove. Number three, a human head. Number four, the loot from the robbery in Reservoir Dogs. Note, there's a character in Dogs named Vic Vega, a relation of Travolta's Vincent Vega in Pulp Fiction, perhaps? Hmm, we may never know. Motherfuckers! So, the winner was a reader who theorized that the Golden Aura was a reference to the Robert Aldrich film Kiss Me Deadly, 1955, in which there's a briefcase that glows because there's a nuclear bomb inside. Pulp Fiction star John Travolta said in a 1994 interview, I don't know what's in the case, and Quentin doesn't want us to say even if we think we have an idea, but he does want everyone to have their own interpretation, and I like that. Some people say it's the hope of man. With all due respect, John, the hope of man is that you don't do a sequel to Battlefield Earth. <sighs> My colleague Robert or Roger Ebert tackled the briefcase mystery in a couple of his syndicated Answer Man columns, one of which included an explanation from Roger Avery, who along with Tarantino won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for their script. Originally, the briefcase contained diamonds, brought, uh, wrote Avery, but that was just that just seemed too boring and predictable. So it was decided that the contents of the briefcase were never to be seen. This way, each audience member would fill in the blank with their own ultimate contents. All you were supposed to know was that it was so beautiful. No prop master can come up with something bigger than each individual's imagination, and at least. That was the original idea. Avery goes on to explain that somebody made the decision to put an orange light bulb in the briefcase, a decision he calls a mistake, which narrowed the mystery item's possibilities to something supernatural. Despite the friend of a friend's claim that Tarantino has settled the debate, he has never gone on the record with an explanation of the Pulp Fiction mystery, Probably because there is no explanation. It's whatever you want it to be. Personally, I think it's a miniature tanning bed. That that would explain the glow. Well, for me, guys, I thought uh, it was okay. So remember when uh, when that guy was uh, assaulted by the by the freak and, and shit and. Pretty sure it was that guy's penis. I, I thought he, they cut off his penis and stole it and it's in a briefcase and that's why he wanted it so bad because that was that was his vendetta. That was his, uh, what do they call it? Man, COVID brain. Mm. Not victory. What the crack is the word? When you get back as somebody, I can't think of it. Mm. It's futile. Anyways, I thought it was his way of getting back at the guy. Hey, I got your penis after you sexually assaulted me. Um, his revenge. That's it. The R word. Revenge. All right, Ms. Mia Wallace. We motherfuckers are going to go to our first musical break. On this break, we have Mr. Brick Casey from Boston with Mr. Cellular Man. Then we got Miss Mocha T with Future Plan and Miss Mystique with If I Slip and I Want It All. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this musical break. Hello? I'm trying to call my baby buddy. It's poor reception on Let's go. 
name twice. How you doing, boo? Cool, how's your date? Nice. Now she ain't picking up, plus a text her. Put the ticket plane, she's the one to get next to. It's not just the way it's all day with affection. I'm hoping this detection is poor reception. Straight to the machine, mean it's like clicking my car, get connected quick. I'm saying, hey, Mr. Say hello, phone man. I see there's something wrong with my line. I try to dial my baby's number. She working and the second time I call, I'm like a little bit hurting. But the third time I call, I'm like going berserk and now half a day gone. Can't get her on the horn. Usually in the morn, maybe it's something wrong. I mean, she wouldn't take this long to call back. See, we tight like that. She's supposed to be mine. So could you please try it one more time? Hey, Mr. Sailor Phone Man, I see there's something wrong with my line. I try to dial my baby's number, but get click every time.
the plate with it and if I slip Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. How could you love a man who never been loved? How could you show him something he so used to lust? I know I'm young, but I know I can be the one. If he open up his eyes and know I'm the one he can trust. Supporting good loving is all a nigga need. All that bullshit niggas give you is a test to see if you'll leave. And if you leave, you are not a strong queen. Cause a queen to stay still, pray and be there for her king. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my Heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. I love the way he carry himself. I love his swagger. He had me at happily ever after. No fairy tale, this man I really wanna capture. A peek at you, got my heart beating faster. No road runner, but you got my mind racing. Still can call you up and don't know what to say. My friends might say I'm dumb. My friends might say I'm stupid. Then again, why take advice from single women? Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you close to my heart. Future plan is to get you, boy. You all that I think about when I get you. I'ma treat you right, keep you. To my heart. Let's create a kingdom and have a Prince Wednesday. Feel the empire a dream I desire. Like Candy Crush on the Monday. Got butterflies feeling funny. Blunt out the blunt, can't get no higher. Like a fiend who needs sexual healing. Boy, bless me with that business. You're my teacher, you get my undivided attention. Boy, would you come my way and answer a simple question?
Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I want it all. I want it all. Even if you're stepping out of Even bounds, keep balling, keep balling. I want it all. Diamonds and cars. Building big yards, go suck the stars. Buying the bars. Own it is ours. I want it all. Big or small. No more of a downfall. I want it all. I want it all. I want it all. I can sign your baseball. Money making it rainfall. Own a big mall. Owning a whole block. Driving to the mailbox. Cruising in my yard. I gotta get up out this box. I want it all. I always knew that I would be rich. Don't doubt for a minute. Speaking to resist this. Hoping and feeling to give away a million. Just be chilling in the tallest building. Say hello to the mission and vision with me. Hello. Watch cars about a hundred and fifty. Rolex diamond luxury city. Next to Movado Motto. Cock it before the arrival. Lamborghini with bass high. I can hear it all. Hear it. See, back some roof up. It's the stars. It's the stars. High performance car. Super saloon. Exclusive rim spinning hard. Always wanted to build a park. Yeah, I to go to Intermoon. A lot more for the kids. Recreation centers. I want it all. Red bricks, cream coated, paint, marble fountain. As I pass, walking the stone path. Eat it, boom. Home theater for all of my family. Wanna do it for my city. Can't wait to see the chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. I want it all. Diamonds and cars. Building big yards, go suck the stars. Buying the bars. Own it is ours. I want it all, big or small, no more of a downfall. I want it all, I want it all, I want it all. I like could sign your baseball. Money making it rainfall on a big mall, owning a whole block, driving to the mailbox, cruising in my yard. I gotta get up out this box. I want it all. I'm inside of a dungeon, life involves repercussions. Do convince the consequences, leave me boxed up, feeling such a Wow, that was amazing. Welcome back, guys. Thank you so much for dealing with that musical break. And thank you so much for joining us tonight on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm so grateful to be here with you guys and uh, to share story time. It's been pretty intriguing so far. What do you guys think were in Mr. Wallace's briefcase? Put it in the chat room. Let me know. What do you think was in there? Pretty sure it was that guy's penis. But, uh, yeah. That's just me. What do you think it was? Was it a soul? Was it, uh, some of the other things they said it was? Was it a Grammy? I don't know. I'm pretty sure it was some guy's penis. 
that got whacked off. Dude, vengeance! All right. <clears throat> so our next story from Hollywood Urban Legends is Mr. Johnny Rocco's recount. So in the weeks after the wackiest election, okay, so uh, before we go any further, I just have to let you guys know that this book was written in the 90s. I'm trying to find an exact date here. Uh, it was sold in the USA for $18.99. I'm hoping my grandpa didn't pay that for the shit. Uh, I did actually get this as part of my inheritance from my grandpa. Uh, this book was produced and written a uh, yada 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 oh wow this says copyright 2001 so yeah uh it's been a while a lot of this stuff uh to me it seems outdated when we've read it in the past so if you're kind of thrown a, a loop or a skew hey just just hold on there hold on to your cock and balls okay that's what sharon thinks was in the the briefcase some cock and balls hey Go over there by the pool with your briefcase and play with your cock and balls. Hey, that's a good guess. I, I'm thinking it was a penis. She's thinking it was cock and balls. What do you guys think was in Mr. Wallace's briefcase? Inquiring minds want to know. Okay. All right, so. And Johnny Rocco's recount. So in, in the weeks after the wackiest election in the last hundred years of American history, a number of cute little urban legends pertaining to the vote started to sprout in cyberspace. One such story had the 16th century prognosticator known as Nostradamus making this claim in 1555. Come the millennium, month 12, in the home of the greatest power, the village idiot will come forth to be acclaimed the leader. Ooh. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, uh, which one was that? I got a healthy skeptical guess. So Democrats, in particular, seem to delight in the passing of his message around. To them, it was a way of saying, Okay, we realize you're stuck with this Bush guy, but that doesn't mean he's any smarter than he was last month. Nostradamus had it right. So the only drawback... And you don't have to be Nostradamus to see this one coming. Is that the never, uh, the man never wrote anything like that. Besides the village idiot in the home of the greatest power. As we close out the year of 2000. Wasn't George W. Bush. It was that guy on MTV's show Jackass. Nostradamus was rarely so specific in his predictions. When he did peer into the future. He would write stuff like the year 1999 seven months. From the sky will come the great king of terror the, to resuscitate the great king of the Mongols before and after Mars reigns. Go by good luck. Okay, so that happened. But there's no mention there or any of the Nostradamus quatrains of a village idiot coming to power, according to the experts who run the various Nostradamus websites. Nor, for that matter, was there any validity to another quotable quote that made the rounds the claim that joseph stalin once said it's not the people who vote that count it's the people who count the votes as if stalin ever had to worry about such things and then there's my favorite election related ul the claim that an edward g robinson monologue from 1948's key largo was particularly well suited to what was happening during the long recount controversy. The speech was misquoted and or misinterpreted in a number of newspapers, and of course the erroneous version flew over the internet. According to the half-correct quote, which appeared in the Boston Globe and the New York Times, and which was later corrected by both newspapers, the gangster Johnny Rocco says, Let me tell you about Florida politicians. I make them. Then after the election, we count the votes, and if they don't turn out right, we recount them, and recount them again until they do. Not quite. First, the setup. Key Largo stars Humphrey Bogart as a war hero who visits the father and the young window 
widow Lauren Bacall of an army pal. Bogey's character was a circulation manager for the newspaper before the war. The hotel operated by his pal's dad has been taken over by a gang of hoodlums led by Robinson's Johnny Rocco, a Midwestern gangster with ties to Chicago and Milwaukee who has been in exile in Cuba for the last eight years, but is trying to make a comeback in the Florida Keys. Who wouldn't? A nosy deputy gets conked on the head by one of Rocco's boys. After the deputy has regained consciousness, he joins a room full of people that includes Bogey and Bacall. As Johnny Rocco gets a shave, he addresses the deputy. You'd give your left eye to nail me, wouldn't you? Yeah, you could see the headlights, can't you? Local deputy captures Johnny Rocco. Your picture would be in all the papers. You might even get to tell on the newsreel how you pulled it off. Yeah, well listen, Hick. I was too much for any big city police force to handle. They tried, but they couldn't. Took the United States government to put a rap on me. Yeah, and they couldn't make it stick, you hick. I'll be back pulling strings to get guys elected mayor and governor before you ever get a ten buck raise. Yeah, how many of those guys in office owe everything to me? I made them. Yeah, I made them. Just like a, like a tailor makes a suit of clothes. I take a nobody. See, teach him what to do, get his name in the paper, pay for his campaign expenses, dish out a lot of groceries and coal, get my boys to bring the voters out, and then count the votes over and over again until they added up right and he was elected. Yeah, then what happens? Did he remember when the going got tough, when the heat was on? No, he didn't wanna. All he wanted was to save his own dirty neck. Yeah, public enemy, he calls me. Me, who gave him his public, all wrapped up with a fancy bow on it. So, in fact, there's no mention whatsoever of Florida politicians or recounts in the actual screenplay, which was adapted by Richard Brooks and John Houston from a play by Maxwell Anderson, who got the idea for the story for Nostradamus, of course. Jeez, go figure. All right, now that was interesting. Yeah, that guy. I made that guy. Oh yeah, better believe it. So this next story, let me take a hit off my beer real quick. I'm parched, especially after all those yes. Yeah, who did that? Yeah. So foamy. So this next story is called I'm Drunk and You're a Prostitute. Okay? Got it? Alright, good. Movie titles are like names for rock bands. We've used up most of the good ones, but you have to call your product something, don't you? People can't be expected to pay $8 or $10 for a ticket to something titled A Big Fat Stupid Movie We Hope You Like. Come to think of it, that's not a bad title. Copyright 2001 by Richard Roper. But even if a movie has a perfectly suitable and quite zingy title in English, what happens when it has to be sold in foreign markets? The translation from English to Spanish or French or vice versa can usually be pulled off with a little, if any, change in the meaning. But when it comes time to sell a Western movie in the Far East, even some one-word titles would be completely meaningless to the audiences there. Man, I think there's a demon in my gullet. So in April of 1998, the Wall Street Journal's Hall Lipper explored his unique problem in an article titled, Will Mr. Cat Poop Clean Up at the Box Office in Hong Kong? Lipper's piece featured an interview with Doinel Wu, who has spent more than a decade re renaming the American films. Boogie Nights, for example, was called His Power Div Powerful Device Makes Him Famous, while The Full Monty was known as Six Naked Pigs, according to the Mandarin interpretation. As good as, good as it gets was Mr. Cat Poop, and Nixon was retitled The Big Liar, which just happens to be what I've always called it anyways. 
Slipper's article is just the sort of thing at which the journal excels. A clever idea conceived in deadpan fashion that causes editors and writers at other newspapers to grumble about not coming up with the idea, even as they're figuring out a way to quote it or use it as a launching point for their own article on the same subject. One such newspaper was the New York Times. A few months after the Wall Street Journal article was published, an article in the Times, Week in Review, section took a look at the same phenomenon. The opening anecdote was about the efforts by 20th Century Fox to rename its comedy hit There's Something About Mary for foreign audiences. According to the article, Mary was titled, titled Mary at All Costs in France or My True Love Will Stand All Outrageous Events in Thailand and Enjoy Yourself in the Game of Love in Hong Kong. So far, so accurate. But then the Times printed some Hong Kong titles other American and English movies that were so outrageous as to defy belief. Following are some examples. From Leaving Las Vegas to I'm Drunk and You're a Prostitute. George of the Jungle to Big Dumb Monkey Man Keeps Whacking Tree with Genitals. Batman and Robin to Come to my cave and wear this rubber cod codpiece. From barbed wire to delicate orbs of womanhood bigger than your head can hurt you. The crying game to, oh no, my girlfriend has a penis. So much for keeping Hong Kong audiences in suspense with that last title. Apparently, nobody over there was too surprised by the big surprise in the crying game. If that's the approach... Why not just call the sixth sense something like the American Psychiatrist is a ghost? Sorry if I just gave away the big surprise in that movie, but if you haven't seen it by now, what were you waiting for? As happens with almost anything of interest that is published in the New York Times, juicy nuggets of the article were quoted by many other news organizations, including ABC News, where Peter Jennings closed his broadcast of the January 5th, 1999, uh, with this comment. And finally, the new title for Babe reminds us that in China, the communists are still in charge. Babe is now the happy dumpling to be who talks and solves agricultural problems. Nothing like a wacky kicker to end a newscast, even if the wacky kicker is bogus. <sighs> so this half-legend was created when somebody in cyberspace took a satirical list of Chinese movie titles and attached it to the legitimate article from the Wall Street Journal. That's the version that the New York Times writer was referencing when he wrote his piece. So he included a bunch of titles that he thought were from the WSJ sidebar, when in fact... They'd been created by Top5, www.top5.com, one of the funnier and more creative humor websites on the internet. Top5 is a Letterman-esque collection of lists. Everything from rejected Pokemon names to new state mottos to signs your cat is overweight. In August of 1997, the top five people posted a list of 15 Chinese movie titles compiled by editor Chris White, and nine of those ended up in the New York Times piece more than a year later. So even after Howard Kurtz of the Washington Post wrote in the article about the mix-up, a number of media types kept the bogus title alive. For example, the aforementioned Mr. Jennings, who used the babe anecdote a full month after the Kurtz article. Top fives, White told me he's not surprised, but he is frustrated that his work has been hijacked in this manner. There's a Wild West mentality regarding the internet that laws don't apply there. I'm constantly amazed that people who should know better fall for this lazy way of thinking. Top five material has shown up uncredited in major newspapers and on network TV quite often in human co uh, humor columns. Credit, when given, is usually along the lines of, this is from the internet, but more often, the author fails to mention that the material is from another source, simply stealing top five material and passing it off as his or her own. 
More agonizing is the fact that since we started Top 5 in 1994, I've received reports from Top 5 readers of more than 300 radio stations worldwide that have used our material. And 95% of them not only fail to use us as credit, but they act as if they themselves wrote the material. White makes a good point, whereas the vast majority of journalists and even most radio hosts wouldn't dare lift material verbatim from a book or magazine for fear of plagiarism. Oh, golly jeez. There's a different mentality about the internet, as if we all have an inherent right to pluck material from cyberspace and call it our own. In the case of the Chinese movie titles, nobody was intentionally deceiving the public. It's just that some really smart people at some really influential news organizations were gullible enough to believe that Twister would be retitled RUN! RUN! Cloudzilla! Cloudzilla! It's Cloudzilla! Cloudzilla! Or that the piano would be called Ungrateful Adulteress. I chop off your finger. Sure, yeah. And I suppose Titanic would be, My beautiful new boyfriend is frozen and dead in the water. Actually, Titanic was called, well, Titanic, in just about every country it was released. So, the top five guys were the beneficiaries of a publicity windfall again in the spring of 2000, when Al Gore did a stand-up routine for the Anti-Defamation League and was highlighted by his list of Jewish and country western songs, including I was one of the chosen people until she chose somebody else. The second time she said shalom, I know she meant goodbye, and I've got my foot on the glass, now where are you? Nobody thought Gore himself wrote the jokes, but it was assumed that his staff had dreamed up the routine until news organizations reported that the songs were lifted from the Top 5 website. Not only that, but Gore wasn't even using the top 13 Jewish country and western songs. As compiled by White, he was working from a list of runners-up. The winners on the list included Achy Breaky Hip, All My Exes Made in Exodus, and All Right Already Enough with Infidelity. Well, geez, that was, that was a great chapter. What do you think? Where's all the cheers and jeers? Hopefully I'm not too wheezy. I heard last night that I was wheezy and I didn't even notice. I was just glad to be breathing and, and talking and functioning. And I actually got to hit my vape after like three fucking weeks. That was nice. So this next one is called The Jesus Chronicles. You guys ready for this? Here's a surefire way to get people to sign your petition. Include the words Jesus, sex, and homosexual in your pitch letter and in no particular order. From the early 1980s through the mid-1990s, a letter with just such incendiary terms was making the rounds, first via old-fashioned chain mail and later on the internet, a popular version. Modern People News has revealed plans for a movie based on the sex life of Jesus in which Jesus will be portrayed as a swinging homosexual. This film will be shot in the USA this year unless the public outcry is great. Already a French prostitute has been hired to play the part of Mary Magdalene, with whom Christ has a blatant and inexplicit affair. We cannot afford to stand by and do nothing about this disgrace. We must not allow this perverted world to drag our Lord through the dirt. Please help us get this film banned from the USA as it has been in Europe. Let us show how we feel. Detach the mail and form below the address shown. Make a few copies and show them to your friends. Only one name per copy. So, the attached form letter is usually addressed to an Attorney General Scott in Springfield, Illinois, who knew my home state would be an appropriate setting for a story based on the life of Jesus. Apparently, the filmmakers were going to capitalize on the little-known fact that the flatlands of the Midwest look exactly like the land of Galilee. Dear Attorney General Scott, 
I would like to protest, in the strongest terms possible, the production, filming, and showing of any movie that supposedly depicts the sex life of Jesus Christ. Such a movie would be blasphemous and would be an outrage and contrary to the truth. We urge you to take proper action against this moral corruption. It's unclear exactly what action the Attorney General, General of Illinois would be able to take to stop production on such a movie. Military sounding title notwithstanding, the Attorney General of any given state really doesn't have the legal or moral authority to halt production on a movie or to ban the local actors from showing such a film. And by the way, if Jesus was gay in this purported movie, why would he be having an explicit affair with Mary Magdalene? Nevertheless, hundreds of thousands of outraged Christians signed the petitions and sent them to the state capitol, and the volume of letters only increased after a second letter began making rounds claiming that Jimmy Swaggart has reported that the movie in question has been completed and the movie is scheduled to be shown during the Christmas season, so the time is short to keep this ungodly filth out of the theaters. Year after year, the warnings continued to spread about the so-called Sex Life of Jesus film, even though no such film was in production, no such film was ever released. You'd think some of the thousands of folks who signed these petitions would have wondered what happened to the movie. Apparently, they forgot about their outrage, or they assumed that the signature drive had worked and had driven the demonic film right out of production. In the meantime, a whole new wave of well-meaning Christians would be signing the same petitions and sending them to the Illinois Attorney General's office, which was so exasperated that it turned out to be the ven venerable Ann Landers for help with a letter of its own note that the name of the magazine is changed slightly in this letter. Dear Ann, the Office of the Attorney General of the State of Illinois respectfully requests your assistance in combating an international chain letter that is distressing thousands of Christians and those of other faith as, as well. The chain letter is a plea to protest the making of a movie in which Jesus Christ could be depicted as a swinging homosexual. Both our office and the Associated Press have chased down every possible clue and cannot find a shred of truth in the story that such a film was ever in production. Modern Film News, which reported the film plans, has been out of business for more than two years. Moreover, 90% of the protest mail that has been overwhelming our staffs is addressed to the former Attorney General, William J. Scott, who has been out of office for more than four years. Despite our efforts to get the world to uh, the word to the public that the chain letter is a hoax, we continue to receive approximately 1,000 protests every week and at least a dozen phone inquiries each working day. The inquiries and protests have come from 41 states, Canada, Puerto Rico, New Zealand, Australia, Cambodia, Spain, Brazil, the Dominican Republic, India, the Philippines, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Portugal. We have concluded that the Jesus movie rumor originated in 1977 when a suburban Chicago publication, Modern People News, reported that certain interests in Europe were planning such a film and requested that readers express their opinion of the purported project. The result was the chain letter protest, which for some unknown reason has been revived and is sweeping the world. We are appealing to you and Landers to help us get the word out. The scope of your re uh, readership and the impact on millions of newspaper readers around the world cannot be overestimated. The postage and the phone calls, not to mention the valuable time of employees, run into a great deal of money that could be used for so many worthwhile purposes. Will you please help us? Neil F. Hartigan, Attorney General, State of Illinois. Landers dutifully printed the letter and urged her readers to ignore the petition, adding, Hoaxes die hard, and the zanier the hoax, the more difficult it is to convince people that it is not true. Good for her. But it's kind of ironic, right? Like, given that Anne and her twin sister Abby have enhanced the veracity of countless urban legends over the years by printing letters from well-meaning readers warning about the gang initiation of the flashing headlights at unsuspecting victims, 
or the children who are being abducted at shopping malls, or the drunk driver who found the body of a little girl pinned to the grill of his car, or the nude surprise party, among other urban legends. A decade and a half later, the Gay Jesus movie rumor picked up new steam, courtesy of the internet. In the fall of 2000, the following email was circulating. There is a movie coming out in 2001, saying that Jesus and his disciples were gay. There is already a play that went on for a while, but never stopped. Maybe we can all do something. Please send this to all your friends to sign to stop the movie from coming out. Already certain areas in Europe have started to ban it from coming to their country, and we can stop it too. We just need a lot of signatures, and you can help. Please do not delete this. Deleting it will show your lack of faith and a lack of respect for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Please help. Please sign and send to everyone you know. Please, if we work together, we can ban this. Please, to sign this, copy the text and paste it on a new message and forward. Then scroll down, sign the bottom, and send it on. All right, so, uh, first of all, send it on to where? If the email is just forwarded in perpetuity, the entity is going to eventually receive it and actually do something about this rumored film. Beyond that, might I suggest that unlike some religious leaders, I would never presume to assert what actions would offend the Lord, but something tells me that deleting mass email messages is not a sin that's particularly high on the list. And I hope there's a special place in purgatory reserved for people who author nonsensical sentences such as, there was already a play for a while but it never stopped, and punctuate every line with an exclamation point. There is one bit of truth in the letter, and that's the reference to a play about a homosexual Jesus who has sex with his gay disciples. That was exactly the theme of Corpus Christi, a 1998 play from three-time Tony Award winner Terrence McNally that opened at the Manhattan Theater Club in New York City amidst a swirl of controversy, public demonstrations, protests from Catholic groups, and even bomb threats, though many critics said the only real bomb was on stage. So according to an article in the Detroit Times, the Manhattan Theater Club press materials said Corpus Christi would be the story of Joshua, who has a long-running affair with Judas and sexual relations with the other apostles. Only one sexual encounter, a non-explicit one with an HIV-positive street hustler, takes place in any form on stage. If we have offended, so be it. He belongs to us as well as you. Ticket sales were brisk for the six-week run of Corpus Christi, but as of this writing, there are no plans to turn the play into a film, and no indication of whether McNally was inspired to write the play by the long-running uh, urban legend about gay Jesus movie. Holy shnikes. Don't people have better things to do with their time? Holy crap. Holy crap, my brain. That is insane. This next one is called Casa Bunka. That's bunk. Usually I would hit the thunder and lightning button, but what's the point? This isn't scary. This is... A lot of this is funny. The last one was uh, kind of... Uh, I can't even think of the word. But yeah, there's no reason for thunder and lightning. Casa Bunka. It's one of the open secrets of Hollywood. No matter how talented you are or how brightly your starlight is shining, from time to time you're going to have to accept a hand-me-down script that's already smudged with somebody else's fingerprints unless you're at the very top of the A-list. We're talking Tom Cruise, Julia Roberts, Tom Hanks, Jennifer Lopez, Mel Gibson, Jim Carrey, and you're probably the second or third choice for a part. Much of this jockeying for position happens years before principal photography begins. Often the first choice loses interest in a project as the script develops or a new director is signed. 
Sometimes a scheduling conflict gets in the way. Occasionally, it's the filmmakers who come to the realization that they need to go in a different direction. These factors often work to the advantage of the stars and the movie-loving public. Would Schindler's List have been a better film with Kevin Costner in the lead instead of Liam Neeson? Could even the great Marlon Brando have done a more magnificent job than Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia? And isn't Cher glad that Sally Phil turned down Moonstruck? Aren't we all grateful that Sylvester Stallone said no to coming home and the role went to John Voight? Can you imagine Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn as Thelma and Louise? Somehow, that sounds like a totally different movie. And to this day, Richard Gere should be sending champagne to John Travolta, who turned down the leads in American Gigolo and An Officer and a Gentleman. Years ago, there was a crazy story making the rounds that Groucho Marx was the first choice to play Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind. After being carelessly pastored about the casting for the movie, novelist Margaret Mitchell sarcastically told the New York Times the part of Rhett should just go to Groucho Marx, but she was kidding. Amazingly, some people took her seriously. Then, of course, there's Casablanca. Believed by many to be the most unforgettable romance the cinema has ever known. Who else but Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman could have played those parts? Well, Ronald Reagan and Anne Sheridan, according to the Hollywood leg legend. How many times over the years have you heard that story? Especially the part about Ronnie as Rick. From Molly Haskell of the New York Times in May of 1999. Think of Casablanca, then of Ronald Reagan and Anne Sheridan. Laughable? Nevertheless, they were the original team meant to play the well-always-have-perished lovers, but Warner Brothers had to settle for Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman and Paul Henreid in the role originally intended for Dennis Morgan. The Independent of London, January 1996. When Wa Ronald Reagan... I want to say Ronald Reagan, and this is 2020. Uh, when Ronald Reagan turned down the part of Rick in Casablanca, he didn't realize that the ex-presidents are a dime a dozen, but you can count the number of genuine movie icons, Humphrey Bogart, on one hand. Actually, there are probably more movie icons than ex-presidents, but that's another quibble for another day. Bogey wasn't first choice to play Rick, stated the London Times in 1998. Those three examples are but a tiny sampling of the countless newspaper articles that have cited this anecdote as an established part of Hollywood history. The story has been re repeated in books and on talk shows, at dinner table conversations, and on radio. Even the most casual fans of Casablanca can tell you that it was Ronald Reagan and not Humphrey Bogart who was originally slotted to play Rick in his dreams maybe before there was Casablanca there was a play called everybody comes to Rick's written by Murray Burnett and Joan Allison the manuscript of that unproduced play was purchased for $20,000 in 1941 by producer Hal Wallace for Warner Brothers an early casting talk centered on such names as George Raft as Rick and either Hedy Lamar or Anne Sheridan as Ilsa in early 1942, Wallace left Warner Brothers to form his own production company, with Casablanca being one of the projects under his umbrella. He signed a deal with Warner Brothers to produce several films for them as an independent contractor who would have creative control, including the casting decisions. So, how did the Reagan legend get started? So, in 1942... Approximately the same time Wallace was cutting his new deal with Warner Brothers, the Hollywood Reporter ran an item fed to them by the Warner Brothers publicist saying that Reagan and Sheridan and Dennis Morgan would star in Casablanca. The item didn't specify which role Reagan would play, but the decision wasn't up to the Warner Brothers. It was up to Wallace, and Wallace's first and only choices for the lead roles in Casablanca were Humphrey Bogart, and Ingrid Bergman. Talise Bergman's services 
Wallace had to cut a check for more than $100,000 to revive uh, rival producer David O. Selznick, who had her under contract. The Hollywood Reporter item was picked up by dozens of newspapers. Within days, however, Warner Brothers was backing away from its own press release with announcement that Reagan, Sheridan, and Morgan would be starring in another movie. Sheridan and Morgan, but not Reagan, did go on to co-star in the film Wings for the Eagle. Too late. The legend had been born. It doesn't matter that Wallace signed a series of memos in early 1942 indicating that Bogart was his first choice or that Reagan wouldn't have been available even if he had been cast as Rick due to his status in the Army Reserves and the fact that the studios knew he was almost certain to be called to active duty before Casablanca would start filming. When Reagan was president, he often blurred the line between movie life and reality. Whether he was invoking Clint Eastwood's Make My Day in a challenge to Congress or relating an anecdote from a war movie as if it really happened. But while Reagan might never have gone out of his way to discourage the Casablanca legend, I was also unable to find one instant in the public record where he personally made the claim that he was first choice for the part. You know... Some people's kids. It's it's hard to keep people out of the pantry. I think we got time for this one before we go to music break. Pretty sure. It's a pretty quick one. And then we'll go on to fact and fiction. The curse of the poltergeist. Beware. 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 The 1982 ghostly thriller Poltergeist starred Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams as the Frillings, a happily married couple with three children who move into a beautiful home and a new housing development, only to discover that the home is already occupied by nasty tempered spirits from beyond. Turns out the housing development was plunked atop a burial ground. Dominic Dune played the Freeling's eldest daughter. Oliver Robbins was the middle child and five-year-old Heather O'Rourke was Carol Ann, the little girl who sees the ghost in her TV set and is literally sucked through the walls of the house by the angry apparitions. Poltergeist was such a hit that two sequels were filmed, one in 1986 and one in 1988. But according to the believers of the so-called Curse of Poltergeist, the success of the franchise has been shrouded in tragedy. Upon the completion of filming on each movie, one of the young actors has died. A macabre trilogy that started with the death of the oldest child and ended with the death of the little girl who said, They're here! Compounding this unspeakable tragedy, several other actors who appeared in one or more of the Poltergeist movies has also died, leaving no room for doubt that there really is a curse. Or so the story goes. Sadly, the truth provides plenty of ammunition for the superstitious and the silly who want to believe in things like curses. Oliver Robbins is alive and well, but the actresses who played his sisters are gone. Dominic Dune, the 22-year-old daughter of writer Dominic Dune, died on November 4, 1982 at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Four days earlier, she had been attacked in her driveway of her home by former boyfriend John Sweeney, who choked Dune so hard she fell into a coma from which she never emerged. After being convicted of voluntary manslaughter, Sweeney served less than four years of his six-and-a-half-year sentence and was released from prison in 1986. What the fuck is wrong with her fucking system? Jesus. That is insane. On January 31st, 1988, Heather O'Rourke, then 12, was experiencing flu-like symptoms. The next day, she collapsed and was taken by helicopter to a hospital in San Diego, but she suffered cardiac arrest and died. It was later determined that Heather had died of septic shock as a result of a bowel obstruction. The strange and stunning circumstances of Heather's death 
which occurred after filming, but prior to the release of Poltergeist 3, spurred conspiracy theorists and fans of the occult to start talking about a curse. I have never heard a decent explanation of just who is leveling this curse. Ghosts who are unhappy with the way that they're portrayed in the movies, perhaps? Did the deaths of Dune and O'Rourke and the fact that Poltergeist 2 supporting players Jillian Beck and Will Sampson had died in the mid-1980s indicate that this was a pattern? Of course it wasn't. Beck, who played the spooky preacher who shows up at the Freeling's door in Poltergeist 2, died of stomach cancer in 1985 at the age of 60. Samson, best known for his role as the chief in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, died in 1987, several weeks after receiving an emergency heart-lung transplant. These men died at relatively young ages, but the circumstances of their deaths were not particularly unusual or inexplicable. Beck had been seriously ill for more than a year prior to his passing, and Samson had undergone the surgery as a last-ditch effort to save his life. Nor is there anything supernatural or mysterious in regards to the deaths of Dune or O'Rourke. In fact, it's an insult to attribute their deaths to anything other than the factual circumstances. Heather died because she was afflicted with Crohn's disease, chronic intestinal inflammation that led to the complication that induced cardiac arrest. The real tragedy is that her death could have been avoided had the bell obstruction been detected. In fact, her family won damages in a wrongful death suit against her health care provider, and the responsibility for Dune's death should be placed squarely on the head of the ex-boyfriend, who should still be in jail for what he did. Four actors associated with the Poltergeist movie are no longer with us. Two men are ill and passed away. A young woman and a child met with unexpected fates. Very sad, and I've actually seen um, a few videos about this on, on the internet, i.e. YouTube, of people talking about this curse, and, and a lot of crazy shit did happen to a lot of different cast members, some of them being death, but a lot of them being like, uh, you know, PTSD and, and sleep issues, etc., etc., which is pretty common for a messed up movie like that. Uh, when we get back, we'll go on to the chapter of fact or fiction. So you guys, uh, on this musical break, we have Mr. Brick Casey from Boston with Main Thing. We have Miss Mystique with Rampage, as well as Time for School, and we have Mocha Tea with My Life. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this musical break. I like it when you pop it, drop it, swing. Now nah, I don't stop it, doing that thing. Go, go, girl, keep doing that thing. I just want to make you my main thing. Keep going, baby, now don't you stop that. Oh. Vanilla chocolate flavor, girl. The only one that I'm searching for. You the one for me and I can't complain. Sunshine in the time it rains Not around then I might go insane I just wanna make you my brain thing I like it when you pop that, drop that Keep going baby, now don't you stop that uh, Honey, you so sweet, I can't ignore Thinking about you, but more and more Making it pop and drop and sway I could be the king and you my queen Yeah, you good, but you insane I just wanna make you my brain thing I like it when you pop that, drop that Keep going baby, now don't you stop that uh, in the back with the black on Too deep, don't sleep or slack on Come to the money, honey, I'ma get a stack on Excuse me, mom, can I get my Mac on? To the left, then, throw it to the right Ooh. Do it like Ooh. you wanna do it to me all night Ooh. From Ooh. the block, kid, know how to act hard Like brick house, women with a fat backyard yeah. In the club with me and my man's killing that In the back door with me and my man chilling that I'm on the floor, I'm like, damn, she killing that It's going down, no cop around, feeling that I'm that. fly, I'm a god, that I get him get Play a like me, me, two of you with him Call with you a lollipop and I wanna let Help you, yep. number one my top choice of pet yeah, Give it to me, mom Go, go, girl Nah, don't stop Oh, no, girl Break it down for me Get it, get it gone Can you keep it going? Oh, no, no, no Now give it to me, mom Go, go, girl Nah, don't stop Oh, no, girl Break it down for me Get it, get it gone Cause you got it going On the on Can't deny for the truth to fly And the time better look you in the eye A phenomenon that I can't explain Like the things you're doing to my brain You don't only wanna take away my pain I just wanna make you my brain Stop that, uh, can't stop thinking about how you move And all the things that I'ma do to you True, this might be a little bit strange Don't care if I don't even know your name That's why I wanna tell you this simple and plain I 
just wanna make you my main thing. How about you when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. Oh, oh. Who's them chicks all thick with the pumps on? Lumps in the front, back with the bumps on. Not a cat hoping that he get his humps on. The way we on with them other chumps on. Sweet enough to eat and he might bite you. Wanna make love to you, I don't wanna fight you. Nobody like you, not a one like you. When you come around, no telling what he might do. Right now in the club, who the dawn? Don't a man that got it going on later on. I can tell by the dance if you digging this song. You can tell I've been digging you all night long. And I love to be digging in you all night long. Party right here, hottie all night long. Let's flex it to the coat check exit. To the Lexus, Nexus, Triple Lexus. Lexus. Come on, give it to me, mom. Go, go, girl. Now don't stop. Oh, no, girl. Break it down for me. Get it, get it gone. Can you keep it going? Oh, no, no, no. Now give it to me, mom. Go, go, girl. Now don't stop. Oh, no, girl. Break it down for me. Get it, get it gone. Cause you got it going. Oh, no, no, no. I like it when you pop it, drop it, swing. Now don't stop it. Doing that thing. Go, go, girl. Keep doing that thing. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop it, drop it, swing. Now don't stop it. Doing that thing. Go, go, girl, keep doing that thing. I just wanna make you my main thing. Vanilla chocolate flavor, girl. The only one that I'm searching for. You the one for me, and I can't complain. You sunshine anytime it rains. Not around, then I might go insane. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. Uh, honey, you so sweet, I can't ignore. Thinking about you, boo, more and more. Making it pop and drop and swing. I could be the king if you my queen. Yeah, it look good, but you. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. I oh, can't deny oh, oh. that you're too fly. And the time that I look you in the eye, a phenomenon that I can't explain. Like the things you're doing to my brain, you're the only one to take away my pain. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. I uh, can't stop thinking about how you move and all the things that I'ma do to you. True, this might be a little bit strange. If I don't even know your name, so I wanna tell you this simple and plain. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. Oh, that. Relief when it happens and show that I don't play, though. Step it to us will be so fatal. Spark. 
get the wit, no lag. She a spin, 34 bag. That's my wife, and I'm glad. Michael Myers with his stash. Ali with his jazz. A scientist in the lab. JJ Watt in his past. The amigos with the dad. This is why I ride. And I got the nag. Spazzy rode a sack with mystique in the back. Money tall like Shaq. Weapons like Iraq. I am cancer in a pack. The 911 attack. We don't know no slack. You can't hold us back. Rock and roll with that. Much fire. Think I woke up the dragon. I'm the new beast. Speak in apocalypse for a fantastic. Got the power from God. Made the rest hard to breathe. I'm on the surface. Roll so powerful. Industry don't fit me. Spark so much fire. Think I woke up the dragon. Life, the quality or state of being alive, a living organism, and I am Mocha Tea. Let's get it. My life, the sugar, honey, iced tea. They wonder why I smile so gracefully and wonder why I like blue jeans. When I'm lactose, ten toes, ten fingers, nigga, ten hoes. Flow dope, whip it, microwave, and stove was broke. Broke days, broke weeks, even broke months. A rich don't will have them going crazy. Lettuce and mac and cheese got them going crazy. Irregular, abnormal, and unusual. You so unusual, I got shot for being beautiful. You can tell me love, you so gorgeous. But yet got a gun pouring to my forehead. Yo, head break bread, yeah, we gon' feast. Remember the cold, cold nights, we had nothing to eat. Southern Bell raising hell, area near you. I'm hungry, and leaving no proof. My life, my life, my life. It ain't always sunshine in my life. A big puzzle, I'm trying to figure peace ain't right. They thought I wasn't going to make it. I know they did it. It's visual. Check your vision if you got the issue. A issue, a news feed if you got the memo. Breaking news, a new wave coming. coming. Fuck a wave, hurricane, so more delicious. I really do this. It's in my blood. Pass it to my kids when I have some. And that's hip hop. Move away from the negativity, it got you bit. And if you get in the midst, just 
take the time and repent. Stay focused, get a pencil, write about the lesson. Raise your righteous hand, find the answer to questions. Can be your main plan, leave a saucy impression. You are your own fan, you got this. This is what I recommend. Do you believe? Do you believe? Are you ready? Are you ready? It's time for school. Roll out your red copy. You gotta love to learn and have fun. It's time for school. Do you believe? Are you ready? It's time for school. Roll out your red carpet. You got to love to learn and have fun. It's time for school. Back then, I loved school. I was cool. I was putting in my dues. I ain't want to be no fool. Mama had a copy. School supplies and shopping. Success was an option. Math had me locked in, but English was my topic. Lunchtime, I had it rocking. Lunch tables was knocking, and we wasn't stopping. In gym, I was good from the three. Like Stockton, music class, I had everyone stuck. They was watching. We wore your bow straps with retros and the watches. Love life. Humble yourself. That's my creed. Think with your mind and heart. You will achieve. Pray on it, give it to God and proceed your goals. Ambition and God is all you need. Imagination and will is something we can't teach. Remember Dr. King, he had a whole dream. You can do whatever you want. I believe. Do you believe? Do you believe? Are you ready? Are you ready? It's time for school. Roll out your red copy. You gotta love to learn and have fun. It's time for school. Do you believe? Are you ready? Welcome back, children. Hope you're ready for school. So, uh, we're on our next chapter, which is a fact of fiction. Oh, I'm a queen, am I? <laughs> Thank you, Princess Sharon. So, Mr. Moon, welcome. It's a delight to have you in the class today. So he's like, what, what, what are we teaching to the class next? Uh, the next story is called Tom Green's Nazi Prank. Well, I, I'm going to need to puff up my vip up the zipper before I begin this story. I just got to tell you guys, I am so ready for my sense of taste to be back. Like, I can taste all kinds of sweet things, but, you know, I just had some sushi rolls and it just tasted like nothing like bleh, nothing nothing i need some taste i need some savory in my life i'm tired of this non-savory world all right so like blowfish lime flavored jello Sticking a hot needle in your eye and walking barefoot over broken glass, Tom Green is an acquired taste. Not for everybody. Lacking even an atomic particle of a subtle, subtle wit or comedic insight, the MTV funny man must resort to loud, stupid, gross-out humor in his desperate quest to get laughs. Consider Tom Green's cameo as a love interest for his real-life love Drew Barrymore in Charlie's Angels. This mass hit adaptation of the old Jiggle TV show. Green plays the Chad, a loser who gives or lives on an old steamboat. His entire shtick consists of talking about himself in the third person. Why are you leaving? Is that the boat? Is it the Chad? 
and falling into the water when he's upset. All right, so let's put it this way. Bob Denver's interpretation of Gilligan was infinitely more nuanced, yet the Canadian-born Green, who once earned the ire of many of his countrymen by burning the Canadian flag on TV, is worshipped by millions of teenagers who love his sloppy, weird sense of humor and his fearless quest for a laugh at anyone's expense, including his own. They think it's... Uh, he's a genius. I think he's an idiot. But I have to give him credit for his insanely twisted, yet brave reaction to testicular cancer surgery in 2000. Tom Green turned the whole world into a TV special, and one of the most grotesquely fascinating television programs in the history of the medium, Green had a film crew follow every excruciatingly explicit detail of his ordeal, from his visits to the doctor, to his relationships with friends and family, to the surgery itself, which was graphic enough to make even a paramedic lose his appetite. We saw Green getting fitted for a burial suit just in case the operation went horribly wrong, and we were allowed to eavesdrop on the last supper he shared with Barrymore and his parents the night before the surgery. Hopefully I'm not going to die, Green tells the waitress. Do you want to see a wine list, she replies. The whole thing is so bizarre that when Green makes a joke about it being a hoax, you wonder, is this an elaborately planned 21st century urban legend? But it isn't. To the tune of the theme song from St. Elmo's Fire, the surgeon starts cutting. Weirdly enough, the special winds up being an educational, albeit bizarre, look at one young man's ordeal with testicular cancer. Given Green's utter lack of an embarrassment gene and his now sacred cow approach to comedy, it's not hard to imagine him participating in the comically, shockingly tasteless skit that was described in detail on the internet in 1999. According to the story Making the Rounds, Green had dressed up as Hitler and had barged into a bar mitzvah, doing a bad imitation of the Fuhrer as the cameras rolled and the horrified guests looked on. In some versions of the story, Green had done the Hitler routine in a crowded synagogue. This time, Tom Green has gone too far, went one internet posting. He filmed the bit without MTV's knowledge, but when they got wind of it, they fired him, confiscated the footage, and burned it. No one will ever see this tasteless, anti-Semitic piece of garbage that Green was trying to pass off as humor. Green got what he deserved. Hitler is not funny. No, he's not, but making fun of Hitler is a time-honored way of scoring easy laughs from Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator to the 1960s TV series Hogan's Heroes to Mel Brooks' Springtime for Hitler number in the producers to the Hitler pineapple gag. Don't ask if you're fortunate enough to miss it in the Adam Sandler movie of Little Nicky. The problem with Green's proposed bit is that it doesn't mock Hitler. It's a direct assault on a group of Jewish people during a sacred moment of family tradition. As the wacky and offensive, as wacky and offensive as Green might be, and as plausible as it might seem that he would go to such an extreme, the Hitler at the bar mitzvah story is pure fiction. A new urban legend that appeared out of nowhere and has untraceable roots. I was unable to uncover the seed of fact that might have grown into the urban legend, i.e., there's no record of any other comic trying to pull such a stunt, or Green dressing up as Hitler for a sketch on TV. The story gained such momentum in the winter of 1999-2000 to that Green went on the offensive, posting a denial on his website. A message from Tom Green. Hey everybody, it's Tom. Listen. All of us at the show here have been reading the message board for the last couple of weeks and getting more and more distressed at the persistence at the rate of the belief of the rumor that I did a joke where I dressed up as Adolf Hitler and did something at a synagogue or at a boys bar mitzvah or whatever version of this you've heard. It is so important to me and to all of us here at the show for all of the fans to realize that this is a horrible, unfunny rumor and completely untrue. It may seem to a lot of people that I'm completely out of control and would do anything to piss people off. This is also untrue. One thing that's so important to me is that if you look, 
No one on the show ever really gets hurt. They may get riled, but I try never to cross that line where damage could be done. I always try to be respectful of people's feelings and beliefs, and the writers and I are always mindful of these things when we were thinking of bits for everyone to laugh at. Obviously, the accompanying rumor that I've been fired from MDF because of this is also not true. We really hope this message puts this negative uh, rumor to rest. When you read this, I'd appreciate if you tell someone who cares. All right, peace, Tom. Green also issued denials in the print and broadcast media. It's ridiculous, he said on Entertainment Tonight on January 21st, 2000. We don't do that kind of thing. The Hitler story was also mentioned and debunked in feature stories on Green that appeared in the Los Angeles Times and Time magazine. Contrary to rumor, he did not dress as Hitler and attend a bar mitzvah, the Times story reported. Although it is true that he humped a dead moose on camera. I mean, that's offensive, right? It's interesting that unlike most of these uh, celebrities and his celebrity ancestors who have prominently mentioned in urban legends, Green didn't just sit by and hope the rumors would die, nor did he buy into the theory that commenting on an urban legend only gives it extra life. He took a proactive role in the UL using his website and the entertainment media to issue strong denials. Perhaps if Richard Gere had taken a similar approach instead of refusing comment, he would have been able to shake off that gerbil years ago. That pesky gerbil. Mother humper. <laughs> uh, Sandra, Jay, and Silent Bob will also show you how to tuck it in. Mm, Roop doesn't lactate. <laughs> Alright, so, interesting note. I was in the off uh, audience at Saturday Night Live in the fall of 2000 when Green was the host and rumors were rampant that he would marry his real-life love, Drew Barrymore, on the show. Indeed, and Drew and a couple who were identified as Green's parents were there that night. Barrymore even joined Green on stage during his opening monologue and confirmed that they would be getting married at the end of the show, but it was just a gag. As the closing credits rolled, Barrymore was a no-show, and the wedding set was struck, while a despondent Green wailed and writhed and cried. Subsequent uh, reports speculated that the wedding was really supposed to take place, but that Barrymore had backed out. But from my seat in the bleachers, it seemed obvious that the whole thing was a joke from the start. Oh, what a dilemma. Fact or fiction? Turns out that one's fiction. Who knew it? You betcha. Grab you some cheese and crackers, okay? This next one is called... Monica puts foot in mouth. When the dust and God knows what else had settled from the Clinton Lewinsky affair, Monica, Monica told anyone who would listen that all she wanted to do was fade from the spotlight and regain her privacy. Right. <laughs> right. That's why you did all that, right? Because uh, you just wanted to fade out, fizzle out, and have a normal life again, huh? Monica. Her quest for anonymity included interviews with the likes of Stone Phillips and Diane Sawyer on national TV, a book supported by Transatlantic Publicity Tour, interviews with major magazines, and an endorsement contract with Jenny Craig Weight Loss Programs. What a recluse! You just can't, uh, can't find this woman. So on January 3rd, 2000, Lewinsky plugged the Jenny Craig deal on CNN's Larry King Live, where she uttered what was soon to be called the first quotable quote of the new century. In emails that began circulating almost before the broadcast was over, in response to a question from King about how she had slimmed down, Lewinsky said, I've learned not to put things in my mouth that are bad for me. <laughs> Imagine that. Talk about a double entendre. The quote was quickly pounced upon by the media here and abroad. Here are a few examples. James Whitaker in the London Daily Mirror. A, a quote amused me this week. Monica Lewinsky, 
asked by chat show host Larry King how she managed to lose so much weight, replied, I've learned not to put things in my mouth that are bad for me. What a disappointment for America's young chaps. Rob Bersalino in the Des Moines Register. I can't believe this is true, but I can't resist passing along this email I got. Monica Lewinsky on Larry King talking about her weight loss. I've learned not to put things in my mouth that are bad for me. Bill Flick in the Bloomington, Illinois, Pantograph, under the heading, Today's Quote. As spoken by Monica Lewinsky on Larry King Live while discussing her 30-pound weight loss, I've learned not to put things in my mouth that are bad for me. The people column of Portland's Oregonian, I've learned not to put things in my mouth that are bad for me. Monica Lewinsky. Pandora in the London, London Independent. The mood of Bill Clinton, said to be suffering from the loneliness in the dog days of his reign, will not have been lifted by the news that an old source of sucker has most definitely dried up. The Monica Lewinsky appeared on the CNN Larry King live show, was sharing the success of her latest diet with viewers. I have learned not to put things in my mouth that are bad for me, she confided. Poor Bill, meanwhile, is said to be spending these nights with Buddy, his chocolate-colored covered Labrador. Yeah. Each of these items ran within three weeks of Lewinsky's appearance on Larry King Live. At the time, the quote was in heavy rotation on the internet, and my email inbox received about half a dozen messages containing the quote. I never bought into Lewinsky's innocent victim routine, but in this case, I have to rush to her defense because the quote attributed to her as an absolute fabrication. She never said it on Larry King Live, or anywhere else for that matter. It's true that Lewinsky was King's guest on January 3rd, 2000, and they did chat about the various topics of uh, different things from Monica's social life to her financial status with Jenny Craig Dill, um, her favorite snippet focuses on romance king do you intimidate men do you think like guys ask you out and you go out on dates right not too many but not too many no you don't get asked out a lot no not as much as i'd like to it's difficult i think it's for the man i think it's difficult for me uh for the guys it's it's been lucky that i haven't gone out with a jerk yet no, no nerd, but it's no guy who said, what's your sign? Well, they might have, but it's just, it was appropriate, so. Okay. First of all, let me state for the record that it is never appropriate to ask anyone, not even Monica Lewinsky, what's your sign? That wouldn't make you a nerd. It would make you someone who has climbed into a time machine and traveled back to the year 1977. But I have to say that I love the whole exchange. It's like something from a Met play about a loopy old uncle asking his niece weird questions at a holiday party. However, a further pursual, or perusal of the transcript of that show turned up nothing that even remotely resembled the put things in my mouth remark. Lewinsky said a number of things that could be categorized as inane or self-serving or just scatterbrained, but she did not say anything that could be construed as an inadvertent or Freudian reference to her liaisons with Mr. Clinton. <sighs> My, what are we going to do about this woman? I'm eating cheese and crackers at this very moment. <laughs> Spit it out. It's not good for you. <laughs> You're funny, Sharon. I love you, sister. All right, so our next article is known as Johnny Carson's Quips. I need a sucker of my beer. And hit off my vape. God forbid. And a jam off of my monster. I'm just kidding. Alright, so Johnny Carson's quips. Johnny Carson was the perfect talk show host for his era. In no small part because he knew exactly where the line of good taste was. And rather than cross it, he'd just give it a little nudge from time to time. Carson had an instinctive fill for adult comedy, 
If a voluptuous actress was spilling out of her gown, he wouldn't gawk at her like a horny frat boy. He'd raise an eyebrow to the camera in a subtle, conspiratorial manner. If some ditzy starlet left herself wide open for the kill in an inane comment, he'd score with a double entendre remark instead of going for an easy and somewhat cruel laugh at her expense. Johnny ruled the late-night airwaves at a time when it was an accepted practice for the leering band members to whistle and issue catcalls when some babe sashayed onto the set, but he never tried the jokes Jay Leno and David Letterman routinely get away with every night. He would have been booted from the airwaves faster than you could say Jack Parr's water closet. And yet the story of Carson's lurid little exchange with Zha Zha Gabor, or Raquel Welch, or Zoe Heatherton, or Farrah Fawcett, lives on as an accepted part of The Tonight Show history. Most fans believe it happened just as surely as they know Ed Ames once threw a tomahawk that nailed a wooden dummy in the crotch area, and that Johnny once paid a surprise visit to the set of CPO Sharky to derate or berate Don Rickolds for breaking his desktop cigarette box, and that Dean Martin once tapped his cigarette ashes into the cup of an unwitting George Goebel while the audience roared. The only difference is that while tapes of the Ames and Rickles and Goebel incidents were always trotted out for anniversary shows and can be found on Best of Carson video compilations, no records exist of Zsa Zsa and her moment except in the imaginative memories of millions who have convinced themselves that they were watching the show the night it happened. So, according to the insistent storytellers, the notorious episode took place in the mid-1960s when Zsa Zsa was still considered to be something of a sex pot and enough of a celebrity attraction to be a regular guest on The Tonight Show. Upon her introduction, Gabor pranced onto set in a tight mini skirt and high heels, reveling in the hearty cheers, reveling in the hearty cheers from the male audience members. She was carrying a white Persian cat, which she kept in her lap and stroked with a sensual motion as Carson conducted his interview and pretended to ignore the creature, letting the sexual tension build while the audience teetered and giggled. Finally, with his impeccable sense of timing, Carson said, I see you've brought a furry little friend along with you tonight. That's right, said Zsa Zsa, and she continued to run her fingers through the cat's luxurious fur. Would you like to pet my pussy, Johnny? Carson waited for the giggles to die down before he deadpanned. Sure, move that cat. Let us now consider the guidelines regarding acceptable behavior and language on the network television in the supposedly swinging 1960s. Married couples on the sitcom slept in separate twin beds. Angry teenagers said, gosh darn it, you could have even uh, say damn on TV in those days with incurring the wrath of the Federal Communications Commission. In fact, Carson was cited by the FCC in the mid-1960s for a number of slightly risque comments and sketches that wouldn't make anyone blink in 2001. So even if uh, Gabor had given Johnny such a perfect setup, and had he executed the lascivious tip-in, the conversation never would have made it past the network censors. That's academic, because the incident never happened. None of the books about Carson mention such an incident, nor does Gabor make reference to it in her autobiography. That Gabor's name has been supplanted over the years by Welch, Heatherton, Fawcett, et al. as further indication that the story was false. But what a widespread you well it is, to the point where Jane Fonda, of all people, broached the subject with Carson in the 1989 Tonight Show appearance, by which time the actual words from the apocryphal conversation could be used. At the time, Zsa Zsa Gabor's name was back in the news because of her arrest for slapping a Beverly Hills motorcycle cop after a traffic stop. Of course, this was a great fodder for Carson's monologue, as well as a launching point for Fonda's query. You were talking about Zsa Zsa Gabor earlier, she said. My son said, you know, she was on The Tonight Show one time. She came there with a cat on her lap, and she said to you, do you want to pet my pussy? And my son said that you said, I'd love to if you'd remove that damn cat. Is it true? No, said Carson. I think I would recall that. 
almost as famous is the exchange between Car uh, Carson and Mrs. Arnold Palmer, who told Johnny how she brought her husband good luck. I always kiss his balls the night before a big tournament. I'll bet that makes his putter stand up, replied Johnny. Sometimes it's Mrs. Jack Nicholas or Mrs. Tom Watson who feeds Carson the straight line. Couldn't an exchange like that have made it past the censors? Maybe so, though once again, the next time anyone produces a record of that incident will be the first time anyone produces a record of that incident. And consider this, why in the world would The Tonight Show book a golfer's wife to be on the show anyway? Nothing against the spouses of the world's best golfers, but otherwise unknown significant others have never been in such demand on network talk show circuit. Ah, uh, but what about the time when Birch Rentals, poor Birch Reynolds, was a guest host on The Tonight Show, and he gave a number out a number that people could use to make free long distance calls. Remember that? Wasn't that great? See, Reynolds was mad at the phone company because they screwed him somehow on a bill. So he got his revenge by going on The Tonight Show and revealing a super secret number that could be used to make long distance calls without getting billed. People were lucky enough to be watching that night, got away with making one call after another until the phone company realized what was going on and disconnected the special number. Or so the story goes. Sometimes it's Carson himself who gives out the magic number. More often it's someone like Reynolds who does it while guest hosting. In some tellings, the celebrity gives out his own credit card number in a burst of generosity after having won a large settlement in a lawsuit or... He reveals the credit card number of another showbiz personality with whom he's feuding. This version of the urban legend resurfaced in the early 1990s with Arsenio Hall giving out Eddie Murphy's Visa card number to fans after he and Murphy supposedly had a falling out over a woman. The gal in question? None other than Zsa Zsa Gabor. You must be surprised. <laughs> That's amazing. Little deck, sir. What? Little deck? You, you have little deck, sir? Hmm. That's our next uh, story. It's one of the most famous stories on Capitol Hill. Still repeated to this day, even though former actor Fred Grandy hasn't been a congressman since 1994. It seems that when the ex-star of The Love Boat arrived in Washington in 1986 after having been elected to the House of Representatives, he was determined to be taken seriously, and he made it clear that he wouldn't tolerate any references to his stint with Captain Steubing and friends. Unfortunately, the congressional page wasn't aware of this policy, and one day when the freshman Iowa uh, congressman stepped into a crowded elevator, the page cracked. Lido deck, sir? Everyone laughed, except Grandy, that is, who turned crimson red and had the page fired. Or so the story goes. This urban legend is dogged Grandy for 15 years, but in a way, he has only himself to blame. First of all, he was on that lame-ass show for all those years, playing the idiot gopher, if Rob Reiner had been elected to Congress, people in Washington would have been saying, How's it going, meathead? If Jimmy J.J. Walker had run for office, he would have to endure cries of dynamite wherever he campaigned. So it seems only logical that someone would make a love boat joke from time to time at Gopher's, I mean, Grandy's expense. Beyond that, it was Grandy himself who gave rise to the legend in speeches that he gave in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Consider the shtick he did for the Washington Press Club in 1987. The Ollie joke is a reference to Oliver North. It's a thrill for somebody like me to be asked for my opinion. In my old line of work, the only Ollie I knew worked with Cook Lynn Fran. In fact, the only Ollie you know works with Cook Lynn Fran too. The house operator still asks me, Speaker's Lobby or Lido Deck? Hey now. The joke was picked up by a number of publications, including People Magazine and the Chicago Tribune. 
Little wonder with, that within a few years, the story was being repeated as fact, with the added twist that Grandy had exploded at the congressional page operating the elevator. In a 1992 article syndicated by Knight Rider newspapers, a former page repeated the story and added, Grandy went absolutely crazy. Rumor has it, the page lost his job. Years later, the Heard on the Hill feature in Roll Call included a reminder from writer Jim Vethe of one of the funniest stories I heard upon arriving in Capitol Hill years back. Congressman Gopher, who hated references to his love boat days, boarded a Capitol Hill elevator years ago, and a wisecracking elevator operator turned to Grandy and deadpanned, Little Dick! An intern laughed, but Grady didn't, and the next day the elevator operator was looking for new work. The story goes. By then, Grandy wasn't telling the joke on himself anymore. In a June 2000 interview with the Seattle Times, he said, There was a story that haunted me when I first got elected, that once I got on the member's elevator to go up on a vote, and there was a page on the elevator, and he asked me if I was going to get off at the Lido Deck. And the apocryphal story is that I had him summarily fired and sent back to the Muskogee or whatever. First of all, I couldn't have done that even if I'd wanted to. Two, it wasn't true. It was a joke I was telling on myself at the time. A joke that backfired big time when it turned into a long-lasting urban legend. Fred Grandy is obviously an intelligent man of the world who doesn't deserve to be called gopher anymore, and who should not be remembered in Washington only for his former actor, who took himself so seriously that he had a kid fired for making an innocent joke. That said, if you're ever on an elevator someday, and the doors open and Mr. Grandy walks in, for my sake, please do it. Please smile brightly and say, Little dick, sir? Oh, no. Okay, so Mooney's saying, although definitively disproving his claim is impossible since nearly all the tapes from the first decade of Car Carson's tenure of The Tonight Show host, 1962 to 72, were erased or discarded. Other available evidence, or lack thereof, is sufficient to justify assigning this legend as apocryphal status. Indeed. Indeed, my good friend. Oh, this one's a long one. Unrelated legends. <sighs> I was asked Shirley MacLaine what she thought of Warren Beatty as a leading man and whether she considered playing opposite him in a film. She laughed uproariously and said, It would be very interesting to co-star with Warren, though I don't think I love a scene. I don't think a love scene would be a great idea. Probably not, seeing as how McLean and Betty, or Beatty, are brother and sister. Hey, my. We know that, but we kind of forget it from time to time, don't we? Warren and Shirley look nothing like each other, and they're rarely seen together, and they seem to be from different worlds. Warren being a citizen of the planet Earth, and Shirley hailing from her own special galaxy. It's hard to picture them growing up as siblings. Not that McLean and Beatty are the only surprising relatives in Hollywood. Consider these other interesting celebrity combos with blood ties. Larry Hagman of I Dream of Jeannie and Dallas Fame is the son of Mary Martin, best known for playing Peter Pan on Broadway. Wacky, tattoo spangled, American award winning actress Angelina Jolie is the daughter of Academy Award-winning actor John Voight. He played the coach in Varsity Blues for you kids out there that uh, don't remember the guy. Comic genius Albert Brooks, real name Albert Einstein, if you can believe it, is the brother of Super Dave Osborne, real name Bob Einstein, and their father was beloved radio comic Harry Parkiarkis Einstein. Berkey at Carcass. Berkey Einstein. Mia Farrow is the daughter of the late Maureen O'Sullivan. Actress Talia Shire, Adrian, in the Rocky films, is the sister of director Francis Ford Coppola, who, of course, oversaw her performance as Connie Corleone in the Godfather flicks. 
Nicholas Cage is Coppola's nephew. In fact, Cage used his given name of Nicholas Coppola in the credits for Fast Times at Ridgemont High, in which he has a tiny role. Actress Dina Merrill's father was E.F. Hutton. When he talked, she presumably listened. Piano pounding wild man Jerry Lee Lewis is the first cousin of remorseful televangelist Jimmy Swaggart. Carrie, aka Princess Laird, Fisher is the daughter of Debbie Reynolds and Eddie Fisher. <clears throat> Richard Patrick, the lead singer in the band Filter, Take My Picture, is the brother of Robert Patrick, who was in the Terminator 2 and is now in the X-Files. Or was. Actress Blythe Danner's daughter is Gwyneth Paltrow. Melanie Griffith is the daughter of Tippy, the bird's hedron. Actress Ann Baxter was the granddaughter of famed arch architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Actress Natasha Gregson Wagner is the daughter of Natalie Wood. Then there are the celebrities who are related not by blood or marriage, but by urban legend. They're often linked because of a passing physical resemblance or because someone made a joke that was taken seriously. And all it takes is one posting on the internet for that misunderstood joke to become an accepted part of Hollywood lore. The story of Phyllis Diller is Susan Lukey's mom and that Lukey, Lucci, the fellow soap opera actress Robin Stracer, our sisters, started making the rounds in the late 1980s and picked up steam again a decade later. Lucci began playing Erica Kane on the ABC TV soap All My Children in 1970 and she racked up something like 624 daytime Emmy nominations before finally winning one of the damn things in 1999. She is an attractive, diminutive woman with chestnut hair and sharp facial features, as is Stracer, who stars on another ABC TV soap, One Life to Live. Lucci was born December 23, 1948, in Westchester, New York. Stracer entered the world on May 7, 1945, in the Bronx. Certainly, Stracer and Lucci could play sisters, sisters who are in love with the same man, who's dying of a terminal illness and has a mysterious secret and a made-for-TV weeper. But could Phyllis Diller be the mother of these two divas? There actually is more than a hint of a physical resemblance between the wacky Diller and the melodramatic sister Stracer and Lucci. As of this writing, Diller is 83, Stracer is 55, and Lucci is 52. So it's chronologically possible. Yet nobody is related to anybody in this scenario. Diller was a 37-year-old mother of five when she launched her performing career, perfected the domestic goddess routine decades before Roseanne followed a familiar, similar path. But neither Stracer nor Lucci were among the five kids Diller had with husband Sherwood, forever immortalized as Fang in her routines. Nor are Stracer and Lucci related to one another. It's easy to see how Lucci and Stracer could be linked. They're soap opera stars, a few years apart, who look like each other, simple. But my guess is that Lucci Diller, urban legend, was hatched by someone who thought it would be funny, in a slightly mean kind of way, to start the rumor that the aging soap queen was, in fact, the daughter of someone who deliberately uglied herself up and made her plain appearance a cornerstone of her comedy routines. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Neil Diamond, sure, must be proud. He has not one, but two famous sons. Mike D, full name Mike Diamond of the Beastie Boys, and actor Dustin Diamond, best known for playing Screech for all those years on Saved by the Bell. Or so the UL goes. So the idea of Mr. Sung Sung Blue bothering one of the rowdy Beastie Boys is pretty funny. Oh, for a duet, duet of You Don't Bring Me Flowers or Forever in Blue Jeans. But it's not true, nor is the love on the rocks man the paternal figure of life of Dustin Diamond. Although, once again, the idea of Screech joining his glitter-outfitted father on stage in Vegas is a hoot. Hoot. Incidentally, Neil Diamond's name is Neil Diamond. 
Some biographies list Diamond's birth name as Noah Kaminsky, but the singer was born with the name of Neil Leslie Diamond in Brooklyn, New York on January 24th, 1941. His birth records and high school yearbooks confirm that he has always gone by the name of Neil Diamond. The Noah Kaminsky story was the inadvertent creation of Diamond himself, who told the New York Times that Barbara Walters, in interviews several years apart, that he had seriously considered changing his name to that moniker. Diamond has also said he thought about going with the stage name of Ice Cherry, or Ice Cherry, which is spelled E-I-C-E, Cherry. For the record, Neil Diamond sang Cherry Cherry, but he was never named Ice Cherry or Noah Kaminsky. He has four children, including two sons, but their names are Jesse and Micah, and neither one has ever been a Beastie Boy or anyone or an annoying actor on a campy, corny TV show. Oh my goodness, this next one. It's a hoot, you betcha. Was Lucy a commie? What? Come on. Come on. Lucy, you have some splendid to do. So Desi Arnaz wasn't the only one bellowing that catchphrase back in the 1950s. The FBI and the dreaded House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, essentially were saying the same thing to the flame-haired comedian Lucille Ball in 1953 as they asked the musical question, are Lucy's politics a deeper shade of red than her hair? Don't laugh. Well, go ahead and laugh. But let's not forget that in the early 1950s, the likes of J. Edgar Hoover and Senator, Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy and his witch-hunting henchmen rocked loyalties and destroyed lives by casting a wide-ranging net of suspicion over any actor, writer, producer, or director who had displayed even the slightest inclination towards communist activities. You didn't have to be a card-carrying member of the party to attract the government's scent. All it took was the scent of the communist ties. If you had once attended a meeting or two out of curiosity, or if you were associated with someone who was a known commie, you, too, could be painted and tainted red. That taint right. I Love Lucy premiered on CBS on October 15, 1951, with an episode that had the not exactly cryptic title, The Girls Want to Go to a Nightclub. It was the Mertz's 18th anniversary. Fred and Ricky wanted to go to the fights. Ethel and Lucy wanted to party the night away at the Copacabana. Hilarity ensued. By May of that following year, I Love Lucy was far and away the most popular series on TV, with an estimated 11 million homes tuning in every Monday night. An astounding figure when you consider that there were only 15 million television sets in the entire country at the time. Not only was I Love Lucy a huge hit, it was a groundbreaking show on many levels from the technique of multiple camera filming in front of a live studio audience to the controversial showcasing of Lucy's pregnancy to television's first rerun. The broadcast and rebroadcast of an episode titled The Diet in 1952. But in 1953, there was a black cloud hovering over all this fantastic success as whispered rumors about Lucy's communist affiliation had escalated into a full-fledged controversy. Ball had reportedly uh, registered to vote in 1936 when she was 24 and had listed her political affiliation as the Communist Party. Private citizens were writing letters to the FBI asking about the rumors of Lucy and or Desi being card-carrying members of the Communist Party. Tipped off about these stories, the National Heart Association reneged on its plans to name Lucy and Desi as Mr. and Mrs. Hart in 1953. In the meantime, the FBI was compiling an extensive file on Ball, the 142-page file, with some entries and passages blacked out, is available under the Freedom of Information Act. The transcripts and excerpts quoted hereafter are contained in that file. Selected passages from the FBI report. 
records of the Register for Voters of Los Angeles County, Los Angeles, California, reflected that name deleted, and Lucille Ball, 31334 North Ogden Drive, Los Angeles, California, registered to vote as communists in March 19, 1936. Rita N. Vale, a Hollywood writer and admitted former Communist Party member in Los Angeles, California, furnished a sworn deposition on July 22, 1940, stating that in 1937 uh, that she attended a Communist Party new members class at the home of actress Lucille Ball. Val stated that Ball was not present at the meeting, but that the person in charge, unidentified, specifically stated that Ball knew the character of the meeting and approved of it taking place in her home. The Daily Worker issue of April 10, 1951, contained an article captioned, Where are the big stars who once opposed the un-American? Among those Hollywood personalities named, as previously being opposed to the HUAC, was Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball signed a certificate as a sponsor for Emil Freed, the Communist Party candidate for Assembly, 57th District in 1936, that Lucille Ball was appointed to the State Central Committee of the Communist Party of California in 1936. Holy shnikes, time almost ran out on me. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for joining me this evening on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. It's awesome to be alive and breathing and hanging out with you wonderful kids tonight. I really did miss you guys. Sorry about the replays. But uh, I didn't want you to be stuck with dead air. And I uh, really couldn't, couldn't get myself to climb out of my warm comfy spot in bed. But it was awesome hanging out with you guys. I'm so glad you were here. Thank you so much for joining me on We Are Paradox Media. Late night in the Rockies. Thank you to all my friends. On We Are Paradox Media's Facebook, KPNL Radio, Twitter, iHeartRadio, and wherever else you may be listening beyond the Omniverse tonight. I had a wonderful time, and I can't wait to do it again. Uh, next weekend, we have Psychic Chris Garcia. He's going to be on Saturday night. And then on Sunday, we have our favorite author back on, Mr. Stephen B. Ubaney, and we'll be talking about who killed at the odds. It's going to be epic. You guys don't forget we're all in this together. Together we can make the world a little better. And together, my friends, we are Paradox Media because without you, there is no us. Until next time, nighty night, love and life.